My name is Kemper Simpich, and I have spent the last 12 years honing my photography craft in the mountains of Colorado and the American West. In that time, I have used many cameras from a variety of brands and have learned the ins and outs of setting up and using those cameras to create amazing images of the natural world. In this video, we are going in depth on the fantastic Nikon Z8 and using it for capturing beautiful landscapes of your own. This is the Nikon Z8 Landscape Photography Field Guide. What exactly are you watching here? Well, the idea for this guide, this video, came to me while I was working on the uh, review for the Nikon Z8, which is still coming to this channel. I was working on that review and I was like, you know, I really would like to create some content that's not just about evaluating whether a camera's good or not, whether you should buy a camera or not. I wanted to create some content about how to use the camera and take the camera and inspire you to go out into the field and capture amazing imagery with it. And the idea just kind of grew from there into this landscape photography guide on the Nikon Z8, the first of hopefully many guides on various cameras uh, for uh, a variety of genres of photography. Landscape photography is what I know, so that's what I'm going to be able to share, but uh, hopefully on this channel we can do many more uh, genres of photography. But this is a landscape photography guide on the Nikon Z8. And basically we're going to have three main parts. The first part is going to be about setting up the camera. We do an in-depth walkthrough. We set up the menus for like an hour and then we go over all the accessories I use for this camera specifically and for landscape photography in general, which I feel like is very useful. So um, this guide's definitely going to have value for not just uh, Z8 owners or prospective Z8 owners. It also has value for Nikon shooters and landscape photography shooters in general. There's a lot of content, particularly part two and part three. Like it's not, it doesn't super matter as much uh, I definitely talk about Z8 specific things, but it doesn't matter as much what camera you are using. If you're a Nikon shooter, part one has a lot of value because the Z8, Z9, Z7 II are very similar cameras in how you set them up. So there's value there as well. So anyway, uh, part two, <laughs> keep moving. Uh, part two is that we go into the field, we head out to the San Greta Cristo Mountains in Colorado and we backpack in and we capture some amazing imagery. Uh, we do a sunset shoot, a sunrise shoot. Um, it's super fun. And it's kind of a, a, a uh, over the shoulder experience of capturing images with the Nikon Z8. And we go over settings and uh, lots of stuff like that. So it's super fun. And then in part three, we take those images, we bring them home and we uh, set them, we import them into the computer and we evaluate them and we edit, in-depth edit some of them. So it's the entire landscape photography experience start to finish in one admittedly very long video uh, for you to kind of experience and enjoy and hopefully inspire you and give you some tools for taking your own camera out into the wilderness and capturing amazing imagery. So. This video is full length content. <laughs> it, as you can look at the runtime of this video, it's, it's very long. We haven't held anything back and put it behind a paywall. I really wanted to do this entire thing and put it on YouTube and make it available for someone to uh, watch right away. So, but my goal was to create something that someone would, uh, you know, expect to pay for. So. And if, if this video is valuable to you, there are a few ways that you can help us out and create more content like this and put it on YouTube. Uh, the first way, the easiest way, the freest way is please just like this video and subscribe to our channel. That communicates, people who do both of those things, it communicates to YouTube that they value the content we're putting out and are interested in the content we're putting out. And if you hit the notification bell, then you're gonna be notified of the myriad of new content that we're gonna be putting out after this guide. There's uh, a few more videos on the Z8, and believe it or not, I have more videos to make on the Z8 uh, coming out. And Toby has uh, stuff coming out. And we actually are in production on another one of these guides for another camera. And if you stay tuned to the end of this video, 
I'm going to reveal to you what that camera is. Okay, the second way is we have actually created a, uh, I guess you'd call it limited edition summit bid hat for uh, watchers of this video. So it's only going to be available in the description of this video. So if you ever see somebody out wearing it, you're going to know that they too are a Nikon Z8 <laughs> owner and user. So that's going to be available in the description. Um, that would help us out. And honestly, if you just want to contribute to what we're doing here at this channel and what we're producing, the thanks button below this video helps us a lot with that as well. So um, we are basically ready to get started. I'm going to have everything chaptered out. So if you want to skip forward or rewatch something and skip back, um, everything's going to be chaptered out. So you'll be able to move around this video uh, pretty effectively. You don't have to watch the whole thing in one go, or you don't even have to watch the whole thing. If you want to jump straight to the field section or the editing section, feel free to do so at any time. And without further ado, let's jump into the studio and do a walkthrough on the Nikon Z8. Okay, we are finally ready to get into the meat of this guide. And what better place to start than to do a thorough walkthrough and overview of the Nikon Z8, the 45 megapixel Nikon Z8, which came out in May of 2023. So it's a pretty, pretty new camera as of the publishing of this video. So we're just gonna go over the uh, basic controls and tell you where the, the different buttons are and what they do by default. So we're gonna start with the most basic thing that you can do, which is put the lens on and off. Something you have to do before you can take a picture. Um, also, you can see the super cool uh, shutter shield in there, which is so nice because it protect the, protects the sensor from dust and grit and all that. We'll talk about how to set that up in the menu section. So. The Nikon is kind of quirky in that they are the only company that I can think of that puts lenses on where you line up the white dots right there and then you wrote it, uh, rotate it counterclockwise to click into place. So that's, yeah, it's just a Nikon thing. They, they didn't change it when they started the zine out. I don't think they'll ever change it. So um, if you use multiple camera brands like I do all the time, you're always gonna be rotating the wrong way. So. <laughs> anyway, so that's how you put a lens on. The lens I've got on it, which is going to be the main lens that I use for most of this guide, is the 24 to 120 f4 uh, S lens. This is officially the kit lens for the Nikon Z8, but it is a much, much, much better performer than your standard kit lens. Um, it's a great starting place. If you don't know what lens to get, with the Nikon Z8, get this lens. It's it's a fantastic lens. I have a review of it on our channel. Definitely check that out. So 24 to 120, that is the lens. The battery, the battery door is located on the bottom and you just press that little orange latch there. And this is the EN-EL15C battery which is the same as in the Z7 II. Um, I think it came out with the Z7 II. It is, the battery life on the Z8 is just okay. It's fine. Uh, it could be better, honestly. I definitely go through batteries quite a bit while I'm out shooting on the field and in the backpacking trip, definitely use multiple batteries, so. And okay, so we have a lens on, we have a battery in the camera, now it's time to put memory cards in. This door on the side, you just open it by sliding it back and then it will just pop open. And then you have access to the two memory type, mem two types of memory cards, which is a uh, SD card on the bottom and then a CF Express type B card on the top. And we'll get into specifics on what cards that I use in the accessories section. So, all right, we're ready to turn it on. So you turn the camera on, there's a switch surrounding the all important shutter button and you just click it and on goes the camera. And then if you go past where it says on, it slides past and that will turn on 
the backlit buttons and the top LED screen. And this top LED screen is really nice. It's, uh, turn it on where you can see it. Uh, just shows settings. It's great for reference, particularly on a tripod or when you are bringing the camera up to your eye if, in certain situations. So I really do like a camera to have this top um, L LCD screen. I think it's an LCD screen. So, and then also on the top of the camera, we have three buttons that sit right behind the shutter button. We have the exposure compensation button right here. We have the ISO button right here and the video record button slash uh, custom. It's a, it's basically a custom function button. Um, and we'll be setting that up, what that does in the menu section of this guide. So uh, kind of going, just continuing across the top, we have the viewfinder. There's the hot shoe and hot shoe cover. There's the diopter there. And a handy tip for the diopter is when you're setting it, um, you pull it out, you click it out, and then you rotate it to set it. Um, when you're setting it, uh, make sure to look at the text and the numbers surrounding the image and not the image itself. Uh, when those text and numbers look sharp, then you know you've got it dialed in. Uh, trying to do it off the image of itself, the image itself, you're just not going to get a, as sharp as you do the other way. So, and then on the other side of the viewfinder, there's a little button that changes the viewfinder mode. So you click it and you're either an auto or you're in, uh, it's either auto change between viewfinder and screen, or it goes to one or the other. So it's like got three different modes that you click through uh, on that button. And it is not a customizable button like it was on the Z7 II for whatever reason. Then you have a group of four buttons here. Uh, so you have a group of four buttons on the left-hand side of the camera. Uh, you have the drive mode button, the bracket button, white balance button, and the, um, the mode button. So this is how you change the different modes from like aperture priority, shutter priority, manual, that's that. So this is probably a good place to kind of introduce you to the concept of, it's kind of unique to Nikon cameras, how they do it. Other cameras do it, but not as much as Nikon. A lot of the controls on this camera is you hold a button down and you spin one of the two dials. So there's two dials on the camera. There's a one on the front, the front command dial, and there is one on the back. And when you hold down many of the buttons on this camera, including all four of them over here, when you hold them down, like on the mode button, uh, when I, I change the mode as I spin it and hold it down at the same time, the rear dial. So that is just a, a function of Nikon. The uh, exposure compensation ISO buttons work the same way. And so, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of a different, uh, Nikon kind of leans on that control, uh, I don't know, mechanic, um, quite a bit more than other brands. And, you know, I like it. Like sometimes I wish that, um, they had another dial. So you didn't have to do that with ISO or exposure compensation, but you know, it is what it is. So, um, just kind of continuing now we'll kind of go across the back of the camera. We have the key slash custom function three. So key slash custom function three and the trash can button. The custom function three button is set to change uh, picture styles. So, and I don't really change that. So that's kind of a, a handy thing there. Um, the trash can button is honestly a huge waste of a button in my opinion. I don't recommend um, deleting pictures on camera. It just, it causes problems that you can't always foresee. Just if you, you always do that just later, in my opinion, that's the, the wise thing to do. So um, I hardly ever press that button, except for one interesting uh, little mechanic that's kind of a legacy thing. It's been on Nikon cameras for years. And that is if you have the camera on, 
you hold down the trash can button and the ISO button at the same time for three or four seconds and you will get the menu for formatting the card. So it's a quick and easy way to reformat the card. That's a great little Easter egg. Um, and I use it all the time. Almost every time I put my SD card back in the camera, I do that, that little mechanic. So that is the main and hopefully only thing that you will be using the trash can button for. Um, moving across the back of the camera, you have a little mechanical button that releases the eye cup right here, which you probably will be replacing if it's anything like the Z9 because I damage that the Z9 one all the time. Fortunately, they're not super expensive. Um, next, you have the display button, which has a switch wrap around it, which goes from video to photo. Um, you have the AFON button next to that, and then the rear command dial that we already talked about. Moving down, you have the I button, which I think stands for info, I'm not sure but it really just opens up a little like quick menu that you can change and customize, which is very handy. You have the D-pad here. Um, oh, I didn't talk about the joystick, the very important autofocus point joystick. I think it has another official name, but uh, I just call it the joystick, just like pretty much everybody else. So you have the D-pad. Uh, which honestly <laughs> has a lot of the same utility as the joystick. And then the OK button, which is kind of like a, a zoom in button in a lot of modes. Then you have the, when I say zoom in, uh, what I mean is like if you're reviewing an image, you press the OK button and it zooms into 100%. So that's, that's handy. But <laughs> that was about to get confusing when I tell you that there's a zoom in button here and that is to zoom in before on an image before you take it. So basically to check focus. And then zoom out, same thing. So use those quite a bit in, uh, for manual focusing. Then you have the menu button and the play button. So the play button obviously to review images. So, okay, so the back LCD, it comes out like this, which is super nice. It also, comes out like this, just like the Nikon Z9. This is great. This back screen is very sharp. It's very bright. One of my favorite back screen shooting experiences uh, out there. So, and then take the lens off so you can see even better. There is two buttons, custom function one, custom function two, we will be customizing those in the menu walkthrough. Uh, so it's very comfortable to push while you're holding the camera with the your uh, middle finger for the top one and then your ring finger for the bottom one. Those are handy buttons. That is a walkthrough of all of the buttons except for one, which is Nikon's quirky little legacy button. They, I think they, they may have even called it a legacy button, but essentially this button has always been to change autofocus modes and autofocus area. And they have it set on the Z8 to do that and you cannot change it from that. It is only does that, which is kind of a quirky little Nikon thing. They, they talk about that, that their cameras have always done that and they wanted to do it. Um, it'd be nice if it was customizable. And fortunately, if you don't like the ergonomics of moving your finger down over there, in some kind of random way, you can change another button to do the same thing if you so desire. Um, for landscape photography, I actually don't change focus areas and focus modes all that often. So it's actually not that big of a deal to reach down there to do it. I actually do it in the eye menu um, almost as often. So then we have the little flaps. The front one is for the remote shutter release both wired and wireless. That is a another Nikon legacy design. It's been around forever. Um, I honestly think you could, it would be nice if they had a Bluetooth remote that worked with the camera at this point, but you can also use your phone. Um, you also can do extremely long shutter speeds. 
so you don't need to have the bulb mode. So, you know, it's, I've never had to use this and the, the little remote for it is kind of obscenely expensive for unknown reasons. So there's that to consider. This top flap is kind of your video. Um, I don't know what you call it, IO, I'm not sure, but it's the microphone, headphone jack, and HDMI. Probably not something you'll be using much for landscape photography. And then the bottom flap is two USB-C ports. So you have a, a power delivery port and a data port. Um, you'll be using the power delivery port all the time to charge up your Z9, but you will probably not use the data one that often. That's for some very specific accessories that are most common in video. So, whew, that is kind of a nice little, hopefully nice little walkthrough of the Z8, kind of so you can familiarize yourself with how the controls are laid out and how we're gonna approach some of the customization in the menu section, which we are ready to start now. Okay, so I have factory reset my Z8 here and we are going to dive into the menus and set this guy up exactly how I do. So the first thing we're gonna do before we do anything else, well, there's a couple of notes here. One, when you first get your Z8 and you power it on, it does not automatically put you in the mode to set the time and the date. So that is the first thing we're gonna do. We're gonna go down to the wrench menu here and scroll down to time zone and date. So time zone, we're in Denver. So it actually kept mine from the factory reset, but uh, essentially that's what you're gonna wanna do. So this is when I'm recording this. Daylight saving time is on, date format. So you can set this to wherever you live. But, so if you're getting it brand new, you wanna do this right away because you want that data on all of your images. So, and it doesn't do it by default. So the other first thing that we're going to do, is so we're gonna scroll down to sensor shield behavior at power off. So this is in the wrench menu again, it is off by default. This is incredibly stupid that this is off by default. Nikon put this big time important feature that is like, that wasn't an inexpensive thing to put in the camera, which is the shutter shield, and they have it off by default, not protecting your shutter. So you wanna do that right away as soon as you start setting up your camera before you do anything else, because you know maybe you're trying out a different lens, maybe the lenses go on and off. You want that sensor to be protected as much as possible from day one. So turn it on, shutter shield, sensor shield closes. Why that's not on by default, I have no idea. So. Those are the two things we're gonna do right away before we do anything else and forget to do it. So we're gonna go all the way up to the photo shooting menu now. And right at the top, it says shooting menu bank. So we have to talk about banks now. Uh, banks are different than really any other camera has. There's not really another camera system that does it exactly like these Nikon Pro bodies. So the Z8 and the Z9 are going to be the cameras that have these menu banks. And there's two types of banks. There's the shooting menu bank, and then you scroll down to the pencil and it's custom settings bank. There's two banks. You can change them independently of each other. The way I like to think of banks is I like to think of them like profiles. So you could create a custom settings bank for landscape photography and then another custom settings bank for portrait photography and another custom settings bank is kind of like your just standard, you know, I can do kind of anything uh, photography. So it's kind of like completely different profile. So if you use your camera for a lot of different things, you can go through and set the menu banks kind of however you want and then do a whole new camera between the two banks, a whole new camera, uh, you know, for a different type of work. So 
what you can think about with what how what we're doing today is we are setting up a landscape photography menu bank for you. So all of these settings, we super dialed in, super great for landscape photography. They may not be great for other types of photography. So I would encourage you to uh, set up for other types, do other banks. Um, a standard bank is actually a great play to start. We're not gonna do that today, but you would do that. So uh, kind of what you do with setting up the banks. So we're in the shooting menu bank, okay? So you click on that and you have A, B, C, and D. You can actually change the names. So we're gonna call this land scape. Okay. And then click out. So now you can see custom uh, shooting menu bank A is landscape. Something that you wanna make sure that you do is copy that as like a baseline to all the different modes because by default, if we go into uh, shooting menu bank B, the settings, any of these settings that we uh, just changed, that we might have changed, go back to factory reset. So it doesn't carry over from A to B. It's like it's a completely brand new camera if you go into them. So an easy way to do that is so if we want kind of a baseline of settings between all of them, you would set up a menu bank. And then after you had it all set up, you would copy and then paste into all the different kinds. So it's literally gonna say um, both are landscape. Now they're identical right now because I didn't make any settings change, but basically the, <laughs> The A is going to be all the menu changes, and then if we switch to B, it would be the <clears throat> switch to B. It would be what where we are right now. I don't know if that makes sense. So, uh, okay, so that's kind of a intro to banks. They're very complicated. If you're like if you're just going to use your camera for landscape photography, then you don't need to worry about them. Don't set up the other ones unless you're gonna use it for multiple different kinds. And so, yeah, I, I think that's kind of an easy way to do it. It's kind of one of those things that once you kind of know you're gonna to need to use it, you can use it. But right below it, it's extended menu banks. So what that means here, we'll click on the little question mark. So a uh, something that you can do while you're setting up your camera is that for most settings, you can press the little uh, zoom out button Okay, and that has a question mark next to it, printed onto it. You press that and it will tell you what that function does. So increase the number of items stored in shooting menu banks, A through D, to include during photo shooting, shooting mode, shutter speed, um, S and M and aperture modes, A and M, or during video recording. So off, shooting mode, shutter speed, and aperture settings are restored to the settings in effect before on was selected. So, what that means, that's technical speak for saying that if you have extended menu banks on, um, basically when you're in regular shooting mode and you change your shutter speed, that will be stored in that menu bank. So instead of going back to a, uh, it's unattached to the menu bank. So it's a totally separate thing. So um, I think if you're gonna use banks, you might as well use that feature. Uh, Another quick note about banks, I promise we're going to leave banks behind in a minute. But another quick uh, thing about banks is that it is as far as like settings like shutter speed and like ISO and like mo shooting mode, it is like a bookmark in so much as that it doesn't go back to a default. So the way a lot of custom modes mo work on a lot of cameras is like, like you, for your custom mode, you set your shutter speed at 1 1 50th of a second. And if you change that setting uh, while you're shooting, when you turn the camera off and then turn it back on again, it will be back to 1 1 50th of a second. Not the case with banks. It's gonna stay at whatever that shutter speed you set it and changed it to. So that's an important thing to keep in mind with banks is it's like a bookmark. It really is designed so that you have four completely different camera setups built into the camera. That is what menu banks are designed to do. If that's not what you want, then banks are really not for you. 
Okay, storage folder, uh, we're gonna move on. We're leaving banks behind now for a while. Storage folder, NCZ, that's fine. Uh, file naming, this is something that I change because I use a lot of different cameras. I change the three digit prefix, prefix to N, Z, eight, and then I press okay. Um, I change it to that so that I know right at the beginning of a file name, it was taken with the Nikon Z8. Primary slot selection. Um, I do the SD card slot because that's like my working card. Um, we're gonna talk about more about that when I'm actually talking about my memory cards. I talk about my workflow with memory cards, but for now, we're just gonna change it to the primary slot selection is the SD and the secondary slot function is backup. That is how I have it set up. The other options are overflow, or you can change it to where you're shooting raw to one and JPEG to another. Um, backup is what I wanna do. And I'll explain more about that when I'm actually talking about the memory cards that I use in the accessory section. So uh, image area, this is where you change, you can manually change to FX, DX, uh, one to one or 16 by nine. So this is where you can manually change that. There's other quicker ways to do that that we're gonna set up in a minute. But something we are gonna change here is we're gonna turn on DX crop alert. That way, when it's in DX mode, there's a little alert on the screen blinking at you to make sure you know that you're shooting in DX and not in FX so you don't have a huge megapixel uh, crop out. So uh, tone mode, SDR, um, this is not something that I use. So. Uh, as we go through the menus, I'm going to talk about the settings that I use and change for landscape photography. I, I'm going to sound like a broken record by the end of it, but if a setting isn't relevant to what I'm doing for this uh, landscape photography field guide, I'm not going to bother with it. I'm not going to explain it. So if you're looking for a autofocus deep dive, this isn't going to be your video because autofocus for landscape photography is pretty simple and straightforward. So um, this isn't going to be your video if you're looking for things like that. Uh, if you're looking for how to autofocus for landscape photography, then that's it. So it really is specialized. I'm sorry that I can't explain everything that this camera does. I know it would be valuable, but that's not how I use it. I can only really, I'm trying to help you get it to a place that's similar to how I use it. Uh, you don't have to do exactly everything I do. I mean, I would recommend not doing everything I do. I bet as you're going through this process, you're gonna find a whole lot of little ways that you do different than me that are way better for your workflow. So things like tone mode, like, you know, that's not something I use, so I'm not gonna really be able to cover it. And there's gonna be a lot of those settings as we go on that I'm just gonna literally skip over. So for, to respect your time and others from now on, I'm just gonna kind of skip over those settings. So hopefully you understand. Okay, image quality. That is all about raw. We're just, I don't, I hope you, I don't need to explain to you that raw is really important, um, but please, please, please shoot in raw. Don't mess around with JPEGs. It's no, there's no reason for it with landscape photography. Uh, raw recording, um, it by default is high efficiency star. We're gonna change that to lossless compression. So that is the highest quality that there is. I know that a lot of people say there's not any real difference between high efficiency star and lossless compression, but we are gonna change it to the highest quality that we know because we're really, image quality is very important to what we're doing. ISO sensitivity settings, nothing really changed there. Um, well, actually that's not true. All right, ISO sensitivity. So this top one is literally changing the ISO. Um, auto ISO, we want that for sure. The maximum, this is pretty important. I'm going to change that to 3200. And I'm gonna explain that in a little bit. And then the minimum shutter speed, we're going to do auto zero. So basically what that means is, is that it's going to be at your focal length, it's gonna be similar to your focal length. So if you're at 24 millimeters, it'll be one one twenty fifth of a second. So it's gonna be close to it. If you go slower, then it will be like about half that, a stop less than that. 
and then faster it will go like one one fiftieth of a second, okay? So we're gonna keep it at zero, that's fine. But we do want these settings on. Uh, the 3200, that's really like, we're probably not going to shoot any uh, ISO that high, but that's kind of the, the, the roof of what I would do. So we'll talk about that maybe more in a minute. White balance, okay? So we are going to set it to natural light auto. You can adjust it in here. It's very advanced, but you can. But we're gonna set to natural light auto. I find that doing either natural light auto or direct sunlight gets you the best color results on these Nikon cameras. Um, there are other options in auto here, like if you really want it to zero out white and not have it be warm and like zero out, like you want white clouds to look white, then auto zero, keep white, reduce warm colors. Then you have keep overall atmosphere. That's similar to natural light auto, but it's maybe not quite as focused on that. And then keep warm light colors. It's, you know, it's honestly very similar, but natural light auto, it's really nice that it has this feature. So it keeps things just a little bit warmer. I do switch to uh, direct sunlight, which is basically daylight. I don't know why they don't call it daylight. It's, since the film days, that's what we've been using as a white balance, but you know, like daylight film, you set it to daylight white balance on the camera, but it's called direct sunlight in this, but natural light auto is kind of basically similar to that. It's not gonna shift it a whole lot. It might dial in a little bit. Picture control, real quick. We're gonna change that to standard, not to auto. We don't want it just changing it on the fly as we go, messing around with um, like how red or, you know, it, it kind of shifts around the color and can make things look super wonky. Set it to standard, don't mess with that. Color space, um, this mainly affects, cause it's raw files, how they look on the screen, I do believe, but changing it to Adobe is gonna help it be accurate on the screen to what you're gonna be getting on your computer. Uh, active delighting, nothing there. Long exposure noise reduction. If you do shoot astro photography, then you can put this, turn this on to reduce noise. I don't, I just, it will, as however long your exposure is after the shot, it will then take a, uh, basically a black image with the shutter closed, except it's not the shutter. I don't even know what it's doing, but it's kind of pointless and it should be off um, and stay off. Uh, high SO, noise reduction, normal. Um, all of these are, not things you need to worry about. Metering, um, matrix works great. Uh, highlight weighted metering can come in handy. Sometimes if you're in a high dynamic range situation and you're having the camera auto expose for some reason, whether you have it in uh, aperture priority mode or you're using auto ISO and you're having it auto um, and you don't want it to clip highlights, you can change it to highlight weighted metering here, but we're also gonna set that in our I menu, custom menu. Uh, but so we'll just leave it in matrix, but this is a good place to kind of talk about that. Obviously this focus mode, here we go, AFS. So for landscape photography, I strongly, strongly recommend with Nikon cameras that you keep it in AFS. It uses mostly contrast detect autofocus and I find it to be very accurate. I know with other cameras such as Sony's and Canon's and stuff like that, you can have it in either AF, uh, AFC or AFS and have it be fairly accurate. With Sony, you want it to actually be in AFC all the time. But with Nikon, AFS for landscape, there's a, it's more accurate and I find it sharper. And it also gives you uh, access to the very important pinpoint AF, which is a autofocus area that we we'll be using quite a bit because it's very accurate. It's very small on the screen and allows you to select a little area and it's, it just does another level of accuracy. So, and that's only available in AFS. So we will actually go ahead and change it to pinpoint since we're gonna be using it a lot. Uh, subject detection options, auto is fine. Uh, vibration reduction, sport or normal. What is the difference? Um, 
sport, what it does is it stabilizes at the sacrifice of a little tiny bit of sensor stabilization, it stabilizes the viewfinder. So you have a more stable viewfinder, but this really is for long lenses and it's really for a wildlife and sports shooting normal. Let's go ahead and maximize every bit of stabilization that we get in the camera. We're going to turn that on normal. Auto bracketing. Don't worry about that. Multiple exposure. Interval time lapse shooter. If you're doing a time lapse or you're shooting over time, that's where you access here. We're going to create a shortcut in another place to that. Time lapse video. Um, this, you know, you know, it's time lapse video. And then focus shift shooting, and that pretty much is everything that you really need in the photo shooting menu. So now we are going to jump down into custom settings menu. And we're back to talking about banks again, which is I'm sure everyone's favorite topic at this point. Basically, long, uh, long story short, there's two banks, as I said before. This one, the first one did the photo menu. This one does the pencil and you have to change them independently of each other for reasons that are unknown to anybody. So if we wanted to, we could go ahead and change this to landscape two, just for the purposes of continuity. Uh, I'm able to do the touch screen to type it in, which even if you make a mistake, is still faster than doing it the other way. So there for, all right, focus. Not a whole lot here to change. Uh, AFS priority selection, make sure that's set to focus, not release. You want it to be more interested in getting an in-focus image than to quickly focus for landscape photography. Um, focus points used. This, uh, yeah, no, that's not something you need to change. You definitely want all of the focus points on the sensor. All right, here we go. Here's one we're gonna change, AF activation. This is very kind of weird that they phrase it this way, but this is where you change, where you uncouple focus from half pressing the shutter to just the AF on button. Um, this isn't, this is not mission critical for landscape photography. If you are used to half pressing the shutter to get things in focus and you wanna keep that, it's, it's not a huge deal. There are some things that we'll talk about, um, especially with panoramas and some of that stuff, where I like having it just on the AF on button. I like having focus. And then just, you know, you're not focusing every shot. You, you get your thing in focus. And then normally with landscape photography, you're taking the scene on a lot of different images. So, you know, I just like uncoupling that. But if you're used to it, then keep it. But that's how I have it. Uh, focus point persistence. Not even sure what that is. It doesn't have it. Okay. Limit AF area mode selection. We are going to get into here because we don't need a lot of these. As a matter of fact, we don't need any of these. Turning these off basically just means that it's quickly, you're able to quickly jump between all of them. I am leading, leaving audio auto area AF for a reason I will explain in a minute. But so what I have activated is pinpoint AF, single point AF, which you can't change, which is where you're going to live. And then all the way down to auto area AF. Everything else, like you can set some of these custom ones if you want, uh, the C1 and C2. I just don't use them. I just don't use them. And I find that they just wind up making things, uh, getting things, messing around with your focus over time. Focus mode restrictions. <laughs> um, this is a kind of a, a very Nikon setting. Like Nikon is just going to set things like this. Uh, focus mode restrictions. Basically, you can tell this camera what mode to focus in and not, you won't be able to change it any place but here. So if I set this to single AF, you can't change it except for in this menu. So it's basically like if you don't want to get bumped out of a certain focus mode, then you change it here. It's not that critical to us 
that we stay in single AF to change it here. Um, this would be more if you didn't want to get out of continuous. Like if you're a wildlife photographer and you don't want to accidentally switch to single, then you can do it here. But for landscape, uh, there's no reason. I do switch sometimes because I shoot thumbnails with uh, this and I and I want it in continuous. So uh, don't do that. In you, if you want, you can set it to manual focus and it won't autofocus at all. So if you want basically your Z8 to be a uh, Leica M11, then you can do that. Focus point wrap around. Turn that on. Basically what that means is that as you're moving a focus point across the screen, when it hits an edge, it will bounce out on the other side. Focus point display, manual focus mode on. Uh, so basically what that means is that if you're in manual focus, when you, when you have your focus point over something, it will turn green when the camera thinks that it's in focus. Built-in AF assist illuminator, please turn it off. That is the, the lamp on the front of the camera that turns on and if it's low light to help uh, autofocus, it's just turn it off. It's annoying to you, it's annoying to other people, turn it off. Focus peaking, definitely turn that on for manual focus. Um, just real quick, the default settings are great on that. The sensitivity to the highlight color of R, it's all good. Uh, focus point selection speed, normal, that's good. Manual focus ring in AF mode. This is a yes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, I'm actually gonna have this be in the custom settings mode because sometimes I do use it. But essentially, if you're auto focusing, you touch the manual focus ring and it will manual focus. So we're gonna leave that on. It can be a pain because you bump it sometimes, but for landscape photography, I don't bump it very often. So I'm gonna leave that on. Uh, now we're to metering and exposure. I don't think any of this needs to be changed. Actually, no. Now we're in timers and AE lock. Um, self timer, change that to two seconds. Number of shots, one. Interval between shots, don't worry about that. So two seconds, that one is important. Power off, delay, I like changing that. Standby timer is what I wanna to change to five minutes. So to clarify that, one minute for playback. So if you're looking at an image you took, it will stay on for one minute. One minute for menus, picture review, four seconds, that's fine. I don't really use that feature. Then standby timer for five minutes. That's what I want it to be at five minutes. So the camera won't power off uh, until you've been, it hasn't been touched for five minutes. So that's what I want. Continuous shooting speed, none of this stuff matters until you get to extended shutter speeds. Turn that on. What that does is that allows you to go longer shutter speeds than 30 seconds. You can go up to 15 minutes. I don't know why it's not on by default, but it's not. So you can turn it on. That's great for landscape photography, being able to get you know, one minute, two minute shutter speeds for various uh, applications, oftentimes astrophotography. Um, limit selectable image area, nope. All right, view mode. So this is, yeah, don't mess, don't mess with that. Starlight view, this is for astrophotography. We are not covering astrophotography in this guide. I feel like there's enough information in here than to get into the woods of astrophotography, maybe in the future. But Starlight View is great for composing for astrophotography, but we're not gonna get into that for this. LCD illumination that permanently turns on the back buttons. Probably not. Uh, view all in continuous mode, all of this stuff. Uh, grid type. So you can choose three by three, four by four, five by four, uh, one to one or 16 by nine. Uh, three by three is great. It helps you do the rule of thirds if that's your thing. So <clears throat> three by three is great. Virtual horizon type. Now we're getting into some of this much more custom stuff. So virtual horizon type, type A, is you basically get a line across your screen that tells you when it's level. Type B is two little um, meters on the bottom and then the side that help you get things in focus. You would use type B if you really get distracted easily by things on your screen. 
I feel like type A is a little more intuitive and maybe a little more accurate. It helps you get a little bit more in line. So I leave it on type A, but type B, totally a viable option. Custom monitor shooting display. Okay, so this is, this is one of those times when this is my, my opinion, how I use the camera. This may not be how you wanna do it. There's, you know, it gives you five custom monitor displays. I like using three. So I turn off five, I turn off four. So how I like to think about it is display one, that helps me compose. Display two helps me expose and display three takes everything off. So to let's go with display one, we're gonna set. So this one was compose, right? So we're gonna do compositional helpful elements. So we're gonna put it we're gonna turn off detail. I just don't feel like the detail information, it just is clutter. You can get that information on this top screen here and I just don't feel like I need all that stuff. You may want one of these screens to have that. If you are, then I would recommend having it be on the, comp uh, the exposed one. So that's gonna be display two, but I have it off for all of them because I just don't like dealing with it. So this is the compose one. Um, definitely leave on the touch thing so you can do touch autofocus and touch shutter. I will use that all the time. So turn on the level, we do want that. Turn on the grid, we want that. And then if you are using spot focus, you can have that area. You're not gonna see that whether it's on or off most of the time unless you're in spot metering, excuse me, not spot focus, spot metering. But go ahead and turn it off just for, so. This is your compose one. I said that kind of weird, compose one. All right, so we go back. Oh, we click menu done to save that. Then, so display two, this is our expose one. So put on the detail one, that's fine. So basically all that means is we turn on the, um, the levels display which I use for exposure all the time. Everything else you can leave on. So we'll click back. So there's our compose, there's our expose. So we can quickly look and see the levels. And then the last one, we, I turn everything off. I don't wanna see anything but that image. So to recap one more time, Display one is our compose, so it's compositional aids. Display two is our uh, expose or um, exposure uh, aids, which is basically just the levels. And then display three is nothing, which is where I like to be as often as I possibly can because I feel like I'm actually seeing what I do. And to be fair with exposure aids, the biggest exposure aids is that the modern mirrorless cameras in the viewfinder and on the back screen are what you see is what you get, generally speaking. So if it's not, if it looks good on the back screen, your final image is probably gonna look good or you can adjust it to look good based on uh, in editing. So, all right, I think we are good here for, let's go back to shooting display. Viewfinder, hey, it's gonna be this exact same thing. So we just turn off four, our display, Turn off detail, turn on the level, turn on the grid, turn that off. And then two, you can put on the detail, put on the levels. You can leave that on if you want. And then three is, three is everything off. Okay. That's how I like doing the custom viewfinder shooting display. High FPS viewfinding display. Um, this is a preference thing. Do you want it to be super smooth in the viewfinder while you're shooting? It will burn a little extra battery. You don't really need it for landscape photography. I don't feel like I leave it off, save some battery. Uh, bracketing and flash. Um, the only setting in bracketing and flash which you might do is the order so the default is it does on the meter and then the second image is under 
the third image is over. If you do this one, you can change it to where the first image is under, on, over. I actually like changing it to the second one because it's the, it's the natural progression. So the image will be underexposed, exposed, overexposed. So I like doing that. Whew. All right. Now uh, we're getting to the real teeth of this when we are now doing the custom controls. So we're customizing the iMenu first. The most important thing that I like changing in the custom iMenu is I like putting, there's not a lot I want to change. Uh, the first thing I change is the image quality because I'm only ever going to be shooting raw in lossless compressed. Just get it out of your life and go up and select custom, which basically gives you a shortcut to change your custom settings menu bank if you want. Um, if you're not gonna use those features, then don't bother with it. The image size, that's another one to change to. I change image size to image area. So you can quickly change that. This is a shortcut to custom controls. This is a shortcut to airplane mode. Uh, view memory card info. That's one that you can change the tone. Let's go ahead and change that to yeah, let's scroll all the way down to interval timer. Uh, vibration reduction. Yeah, that works fine. So all these other ones, like really the things I feel like the controls with the, my buttons do enough. Um, but you can change, you know, like this one, this one seems kind of like a waste. We could put something, you could do something like, um, silent mode. That's actually probably a pretty good thing to change for there. I don't use the I menu that much. I don't know if you can tell. I have my controls kind of mapped to buttons and other areas, but sometimes I, the main thing I use the I menu for honestly is changing between banks. Um, which is really like, I'm sorry that banks came up again. They just did. Okay, so there's the iMenu. Uh, yeah, I feel like you could be a lot more thorough on figuring out what you might want on the iMenu. If you want to just kind of like, oh, I don't want to remember what button I have that set to, whatever. But I feel like for landscape photography, it's pretty easy to have your buttons do most of what you need. So. All right, we are ready to dive into custom controls for shooting. So let's go. So um, this is how they are by default without changing anything. A lot of these we're actually not going to change. Uh, function one is one that we are going to change. We're going to change that. We're going to go up and change it to display. So basically, the function one button will now do what the display button does normally. And that's because we want the display button to do something special. We want it to, we're gonna go up, 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 up. AF area mode plus AF on. We're gonna turn that on. We're gonna go all the way down to auto area AF. So what did I just do and why did I just do that? Essentially, what I'm doing is that I'm giving myself an autofocus bailout. So most of the time I use the AF on button to select, it's in either pinpoint or single point mode, right? That's the main modes we want. But sometimes the camera can't find focus. This is generally if it's lower light or I'm super zoomed in. So what I like doing is having that display button be reachable, it goes to auto area, that will help it at least find something in focus. So if it's way off or struggling or not being able to find focus at all, I press the display button, it will focus on normally something, it will find something to focus on, and then I can kind of tweak it or zone it from there either in manual focus or, you know, it's pretty intuitive. It does seem to be able to find what I kind of want it to focus on. Um, 
So that's what I like doing. The reason why I changed that to the display button is that like I'm already in that, uh, it's right next to the AF on button. So it's very just natural to me to have two display. Um, there's a lot of potential here. I think you can probably see for wildlife photography, for sports photography, being able to change it to, this is just for landscape photography. The best thing is to just switch it to wide, uh, wide AF, AF on. So, and it will autofocus as you're holding it down, just like the AF on button. So it's essentially, you have two different modes. So AF on is AF on, we definitely want that. Uh, function two is the different crop modes. We want that, choose image area, we want that. So that's great to stay. This is the button on the grip. If you want to change that to something, you can. Function three, um, picture control. I actually leave it to picture control because sometimes I like seeing the image in black and white while I'm shooting for kind of uh, compositional or exposure re reasons. I wanna think about the image that I'm taking in black and white because I know I'm gonna convert it to black and white. So having that be close at hand at function three, that works great. Um, okay, so the video record button, we are going to change that. We are gonna change this to recall shooting functions hold. Okay, so this is an area where I'm doing some things a little differently than I think a lot of people do. A lot of people do have this recall shooting functions hold, but what they tend to do is have it be like, oh, I can instantly go into wildlife shooting mode. And I think that's very valid. I think if you want to have your camera be able to immediately jump into a mode where it can shoot wildlife or shoot something that's moving and fast, I think that's very valid. Um, but I actually changed, I used to have it set that way. I've actually recently changed it because I wanted it to solve a problem that I actually have more often. So it turns out it's pretty rare to be shooting landscape photography and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, there's this amazing wildlife composition that is right at hand for you to do. It just doesn't happen as often as you think. And then also you probably have a landscape lens on and so you're not zoomed in. So, so we are changing it to recall shooting functions, hold, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna change the shooting mode to aperture priority. We're gonna turn off aperture, turn off exposure composition. ISO settings, we're gonna turn on auto ISO with a base at 64. So it'll be 64 by default, but it will auto ISO and that's important. And then we turn everything else off. And then uh, another important side note here is make sure that you click menu when you're done, not this at the bottom. This thing at the bottom is however your camera is currently set up, it saves to this. So you're, if you click that, you've reset everything you've just changed. So to go over that again, I have shooting mode, aperture priority, ISO sensitivity settings, auto. This is why back um, earlier, I had auto ISO cap out at 3200, is that the I want it to be able to do auto ISO when I press this button and hold it. So essentially what I'm giving myself is, an, is like the display button is my autofocus bailout. So if, if my pinpoint autofocus isn't working or something along those lines isn't working, I press the display button and it will autofocus automatically on a wider area. That's kind of, it's kind of a bailout. This is my exposure bailout. So essentially what can happen is, is that there will be a dramatic exposure change. The sun comes out from behind a cloud. There's, there's just a moment where you need the camera to expose for you. There just can be a variety of situations where I might suddenly need the camera to make exposure decisions for me. Whether I've gotten, I've changed the settings randomly, I'm at a super sh slow shutter speed or a super high shutter speed, for whatever reason, I press this button 
I press the movie record button and it will go to aperture priority. So it will be basing the shutter speed on how it's metering and it will do auto ISO to help that out. If you are concerned about auto ISO um, adding noise to your image, then go ahead and turn that part off. I have that part turned on because I really do want it to, I would prefer, like if I'm using it handheld, I would prefer that it goes ahead and gets the image so it's, it's in a kind of a handheld mode. Um, I want it to be sharp. I don't want it to suddenly be like, oh wow, it's at a tenth of a second and I'm hand-holding. That that's not very helpful to me. The whole point of having the button set up that way is that the camera will, in an instant, auto-expose for me so that I can capture an image in a changing light situation. So, I hope all that made sense. So essentially, that is my exposure bailout button. I'm hopeful that when we get into the field in the second part of this video, that we'll be able to see that in action. So, um, and I think that is it. Oh, the lens function button. I changed that to um wait we're getting there playback um this is mainly for the 100 to 400 that i do this it's sometimes it's easier to press that button and find that button to play back it's just also kind of satisfying so i just i do have that changed so the lens control ring i turned that off i talked about that earlier that i don't use that um, the focus ring, you can change the directions, all that stuff. So, but we're not going to change that. One last thing, and this is just my quirk as a photographer. I'm not saying you should do this, but this is how you do it if you do want it. So basically, this is because I learned on Canon. The first camera that I shot, I shot on Canon. On Canon, the front dial is shutter speed. The back dial is aperture. So I think in that way. So in exposure settings, I want in manual, I want the front to be TV, which is the mean shutter speed for some reason. And then I want the back one to be aperture. So that's just my quirk. Another little handy tip here is in focus AF mode selection, I find it a little more ergonomic to swap those, have the front change the, um, uh, autofocus, manual focus in the back, change the area. Um, that's just an ergonomic thing for me, but you could leave that in default and not worry about that too much. So all of this is not relevant. So to review, oh, yeah, no, to review, that is how I have my camera set up with the custom buttons. So this is not necessarily how I think you should customize your camera. Um, this is kind of, this is such a subjective section. It's hard for me to really even know how to explain it because these, I've set up these controls because this is how I use my camera. The two little bailout, the autofocus bailout and the exposure bailout buttons that I essentially created, that's not something that I think every photographer is gonna want or need. So you could use those buttons for a variety of different things. It really is subjective. This is a, a not me saying this is the best way to set up the custom controls, uh, but it's the way that it helps me capture better images. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, how I do that. Um, all right, we can keep going. None of these are super. Now we're into video mode. So again, this isn't what we're focused on. All right, we made it out of the custom settings. Uh, playback, there really isn't anything that's not good by default. I have found a setup menu. Let's go ahead. There might be a couple things in here. Let's take a look. Auto rotate display, 
AF fine tuning. If you're using an old lens, you might not want to do that. Pixel mapping, image comment, copyright information. If you want to include your name as the artist and copyright holder, I will do that real quick. Okay. Camera sounds. Um, if you want to change what the shutter sounds like, you can do that here. Not super critical in my battery info, USB, reset all settings. And this is where you would do your firmware. Okay, airplane mode. Uh, this is your network menu. I don't, I, this is stuff I don't use very much. There's a lot of important stuff in here, especially if you're connecting to your smartphone and all that stuff. It's not something that I use and very much. I, I, I have a pretty traditional workflow where I take the memory card out of the camera and put it in the computer. But there is stuff here, um, but we're not gonna cover it today because we're keeping trying to keep it as simple as we can. Okay, so. Whew. We plowed through the menus. We walked through the camera. Uh, again, I really do want to reiterate, I'm not telling you that this is the best way to set up the Z8. This is just how I've set up the Z8 and I wanted to share it with you. It could be a great starting point for you. Um, I'm actually hopeful that that's what it is. There's so many cool things that you can do and customize on this camera that like, it, it, and again, this camera's designed to do so many things. And a lot of that customization stuff is for that so many things, you know, uh, that the camera can do. But for landscape photography, it's just not as relevant. Uh, landscape is a pretty simple medium. Now, when we get out into the field, it's gonna feel a little different, right? Because then I'm gonna be talking about like exposure modes that I wanna be in, like, you know, I generally speaking shoot in manual and we'll be covering that. Like my ISO philosophy, we're gonna be getting into that, shutter speed, all that stuff. A lot of that stuff is going to be talked about more in the field. So if you're concerned about that, definitely tune in to part two where we're going to, you know, while we're taking images, I'm gonna talk about like, okay, this is why I'm doing this in this situation. And this is why I'm shooting it like this in this situation. To try to help you, I feel like that's a more uh, useful way to cover a lot of that stuff. But as far as settings go, we're now good to go. And we're now gonna jump into accessories and all that fun stuff. Should be much funner and more entertaining than the menu walkthrough. Okay, now that we have the camera all set up in the menus and the buttons, it's time for the really fun part and that is to go over lenses and accessories. So let's start out with lenses. Right now, I am only using two lenses for the Nikon Z8. I am, typically you would think that I would use a wide angle lens, an ultra wide, but to be honest, I don't find myself shooting uh, wider than 24 very often and it's not often enough to actually warrant me owning an ultra wide and when I do need to get a little wider than 24 I shoot a pano and that's going to be a huge theme with these videos for my personal work is that I shoot a ton of panoramas so because of that I don't really need to go wider than 24 I like the way that 24 looks sometimes I feel like uh, composing for wider than 24 turns into kind of a nightmare so I shoot 24 to 120. This is the lens on here. This is the lens I've reviewed on the channel. And it's an amazing landscape lens. Honestly, this is the only lens coming with us on our backpacking trip that we're gonna do. So 
that's kind of exciting. You'll get to see, this is the main lens that you're gonna to get to see in action. I also own the 100 to 400 and a telephoto is just so valuable for landscape photography. Uh, and this is a great copy of the 100 to 400. So a super telephoto for me tends to be, again, a lot of panoramas. I also do a lot of detail shots, um, lots of, of stuff like that. I'm gonna show some of my super telephoto uh, images here so you can see that I've taken with the Z8 so you can kind of get a feeling for how I use the super telephoto. But like I said, we're gonna go ahead and set this lens aside because it's not coming with us on the backpacking trip. It's just gonna be this lens and that is really exciting to me to do a one camera, one lens setup. It's really fun to do a one camera, one lens setup. It's very minimal, it, reduce, it reduces decision fatigue and yeah, so, but there is a lot of other lenses that are great for landscape that Nikon makes. So let's talk about a few of those real quick. There's the 14-24-28, which is fantastically sharp. I've used that lens. It's a, it's a great lens. There's the 14 to 30. So there's your two wide angle options that are great. Uh, there's as far as standard zooms, there's the 2470 to 8, there's 2470 to 4, there's this 24120, there's a 24 to 200, which would really be kind of an ultimate all in one lens. I could get even more reach. Uh, I like that this lens is a little sharper, and at the end of the day, I, I trade the little extra reach for a little more sharpness on this 24 to 120. Uh, there's also a 28 to 75 to 8, uh, which is, you know, I think it's a rebrand of the Tamron lens, which is an excellent lens. So telephoto wise, there's the, the 100 to 400 that we already talked about. There's the 7200 to 8, and then there's the 180, excuse me, the 70 to 180. So that's, there's not as many telephoto options. There's of course the uh, 200 to 600 that you can use for landscape. It's very hard to pack and carry, but if you do a lot of your telephoto work out of your car, the 200 to 600 might be fantastic. I have not tried that lens out. It's actually, as of this recording, not shipping to customers yet, so. And then on top of all of this, there is F-mount lenses galore. I'm not gonna cover those here, but you can adapt and they work extremely well on the Z8 and the Z9, all of the myriad of F-mount lenses that are out there. So you have a lot of options to choose from, but if you can't decide or not sure what you wanna do, the 24-120 is a great place to start. And then you can, it's F F4 constant. Then if you want to add a wide angle, the 14 to 30, and then if you wanna go telephoto, the, you know, uh, 100 to 400 there, which is in a different, it may have the similar apertures, it's f4.5 to 5.6, but it's in a different stratosphere cost-wise, unfortunately. So, okay, that's lenses. Let's talk now about other accessories, and we're gonna start, we're gonna kind of work our way from like that directly camera specific out to all of the other stuff that we need. So, media, storage, this is, non-optional. You have to have a way to record photos. They are not putting internal recording in cameras yet, which is sad. So the Nikon Z8 takes SD cards and CF Express Type B cards. And so my philosophy, so first off, we're well, gonna talk about two things here real quick, the memory cards. My philosophy with memory cards is, is that the SD card is my working card. So what I do with my SD card is that uh, this is the card I pull out and stick into my computer. I have a MacBook Pro uh, M2 14 inch MacBook Pro. And so I can stick this directly into my computer, import my photos, and then I stick this back in and I reformat it. What I'm using the CF Express card slot for is redundant recording. So what I do is I just leave this in here and I do not reformat it hardly ever. So what I do is, is that I let this guy fill up. And then once it fills up, kind of moving on to one of the other accessories, once it does fill up, I swap it with an identical card that's in here. So 
When I swap it with this identical card, then when this card goes in, then it gets reformatted. So basically what's going on is, is that I'm recording to both the SD card and the CF Express in the Z8. The uh, SD card is my working card. This is the card I get everything off of. And this is basically a rolling backup. So I let the card fill up. Then once it's full, I stick it in here, unformatted, unformatted. And then I take this one, put it in here, and then I format it. So essentially what I'm formatting when I put this one back in the camera could be from honestly uh, months ago, you know, or four or five shoots ago. So basically this gives me a bailout for if I really mess up uh, and lose photos in the other ways that I'm backing up. It's kind of a last resort. Oh, I have those files on the CF Express in here. It gets reformatted when I put it back in. So they're on here. Um, if I'm, the exception to all of this is that if I'm on a trip, I do not reformat anything unless I absolutely have to. So basically I'm just gonna be swapping SD cards uh, and CF Express cards as I go and then only reformatting if I really am out of any other storage. So, okay, so we can talk real quick about the brands that I prefer. I have a whole myriad of brands of SD cards and CF Express cards, but my favorite is for SD cards, ProGrade. They're a reasonably uh, ProGrade digital here. Uh, they're a reasonably priced, but also very fast and reliable. I had no problem. And then with the CF Express, I actually like this company called Delkin Devices, and they make CF Express cards. They're very fast and reliable. Again, you know, we're kind of looping back to a common theme here is that we're working with landscape photography. The read and write speeds just don't matter that much. Again, it comes down to reliability. If you're shooting sports and wildlife, you may want something a little faster than this. And this whole workflow may not work for you because SD cards are not as fast as CF Express. If you are using a Z9, then it's just two CF Expresses, so you have no speed limits there. But so yeah, this uh, Delkin Devices, CF Express. I also have, you know, various other brands here. Here's just a SanDisk Extreme Pro. And then I also have a XQD card in here. And this is what I use to store um, backups for the settings in the camera. So I don't really use this unless I absolutely had to. So, but XQ, XQD cards do work in the Nikon Z8, but good luck finding a reader. They're very expensive and hard to find. So that I think covers media. So we're gonna put those in the Z8. So I pulled this card thing. So we'll go over this. So I this is by Shimoda, Shimoda Designs. And it has, so how I have this configured is I have an SD card section, a CF Express card section, and then I have written in Sharpie on here, import, do not use. So basically, if I have to swap before I've not imported anything, then whatever card goes in this area and I do not pull from it, I'm assuming that is the only place these photos exist is on the cards in here. So they do not do anything but get imported. So. Uh, and I've really liked this, this case, you know, it's not ultralight, but, and it has a little thing, you can put a leash on it that comes with it, but I don't use that because I keep it in what I call my photography ditty bag, which is this little, also made by Shimoda. There's a lot of Shimoda stuff here, case. So this, this little case here by Shimoda goes everywhere the camera goes. It's, I'm, I consider it like an extension of the camera. So what's in here is this memory card pouch. The batteries, the spare batteries. For the Nikon Z8, I have three extra batteries. The uh, battery uh, is not, the battery life on the Z8 is not super fantastic. So I have three. Uh, for the Z9, I only had one. I only needed one. Um, 
to be honest, I, I don't think I ever swapped the Z9 battery in the field. The Z8 is not blessed with as big a battery as the Z9. So um, how this case works, and I'll try to show you here, there's a pocket inside. So this pocket serves two purposes. One, I have some other accessories. I have a USB-C cable. This is just like an anchor braided USB-C cable. I like it that it has a, an L on it, which can make charging inside of a backpack really easily. I have a Allen wrench, hex screw, hex key. I have a spare tripod mount peak design thing that just lives in here so that I can always put a camera or put something on a tripod. This is coming handy so often. And I've been so tempted to steal it out of here and put it on something, but I don't. I keep my extra in here. Then when I get home, it goes back in there. And then I have anchor links because sometimes I find that I'm not in a, a configuration that I want, I need an extra one. And I just have actually wound up accumulating several in here. Probably don't need this many, but they, they're not, they don't take up much space, they don't weigh much. So these anchor links are with the strap, which we'll talk about in a second, which if you know much about cameras, the Peak Design anchor links and straps are not a, a new concept. So another cool feature about this little pouch is that this stretchy pocket, this pocket internal is stretchy, and I just put the dead batteries in there with the other accessories. So I know what's live, what's dead immediately as I'm swapping in the field. So um, I'll just repack this real quick. So we don't get too cluttered up here. So yeah, this little photography ditty bag goes everywhere. The Z, the, uh, the Z8 or whatever camera I'm currently using, the only thing that really changes is the uh, batteries. This goes everywhere. Uh, this guy goes. So yeah, that's that. So um, we can talk about straps and the Peak Design capture clip. Peak Design capture clip goes on a backpack and this little piece comes in. Um, I'll be showing B-roll here of me using it. I use it, Toby uses it. Almost every photographer on YouTube uses it. It's a critical little piece of equipment for having your camera outside of your bag in easy reach and having it be somewhat comfortable. So we'll leave this out because I'm gonna show you how I use the links on there with the strap. So I'll set that. And then this just goes on whatever backpack I'm currently using. So the strap I use, it's actually called the sling. Um, I like it because it's light and small. So I can actually stick this in here uh, for certain situations, which is really handy. So I like a small, light, thin strap and it uses like, feels almost like seatbelt material. It's like really nice seatbelt material. So um, I'll show you L brackets real quick because we're talking about, we're kind of transitioning now into tripod mounting. This is an actual Z8 designed uh, L bracket. So I'll show you how it goes on there. But I don't, I, I like having it. So if I'm going and I know that I'm going to be shooting off of the tripod all day, then I put this on here. So, you know, maybe not a lot of hiking. I don't need to use the capture clip. So I'm pulling it in and out of the backpack all day. So there's that, I'll kind of, show you how it sits. And then I have two anchors on the L bracket. I don't put anchors on the camera itself. As a matter of fact, I have removed the little dangly strap lugs. So because I do not like the, the clicking, I don't like how they, just like that whole design is not my favorite. I wish cameras did I wish all brands did what Canon does with the little bars on there. It's just so much better than the dangly. I don't understand, I just don't understand. But anyway, so I don't actually mount the anchor links to it. I put it on this, so this goes on the strap like that. So yeah, that's the, this is a small rig 
L bracket. I didn't pick small rig because I didn't think it's necessarily the best. It's just what's available right now. Uh, other brands, uh, Kirk Enterprise Solutions. They are a really good uh, tripod accessory brand. Like every, if they if they make it, it's really good. Uh, really right stuff has a L bracket coming, I am sure. So that I would maybe recommend those because they're you know they're designed, but they're more expensive than this. But this one, I mean, it's a great design. It comes out around the grip, which I don't really find necessary because the Z8 has such a deep grip already. That's great for a smaller camera like the, I used on the Sony a7R 4 a lot with one like that comes out like that. So, all right. But I actually don't use the L bracket that much because I kind of have a new system and configuration. So I'm going to put the Peak Design clip on here and I'm gonna show you both how I configure it with the strap here. I mean, I, I think you can figure it out by just looking at it, what I do. Give me one second. Gotta make sure it's lined up and straight so it's not crooked. It's the only thing I wish is that there was a way to have it like guaranteed straight and not have to be Eyeball, but it does lock in fairly well. This is a small rig uh, hex tool or multi-tool that has a whole bunch of different, it has a normal screwdriver, a flat, so putting other like uh, accessories on that are flat and various sizes of hex, it's very handy. I don't take this in the field because it's kind of big and heavy and there's really only one that I need, but I keep it around. Um, in my main camera bag all the time. So yeah, so there, I'll show you that. The danglies, the, the dongles or um, whatever, what are they called? I just said, not that long ago. Lugs, strap lugs, right here. They're both facing back. So when I take the strap, I put it on like this. We'll get some b-roll of me in the field doing this so yeah i have it on like that so it kind of hangs to my side kind of like that and i find that that is the best configuration i don't have to have the lugs on the camera i can remove them they're just on there it still works just fine with any tripod or the capture clip which the capture clip well it, it works fine with the capture clip i'm not going to unscrew that the whole thing right now so it works fine with the capture clip and it also works with this thing, which is I just discovered recently. And what I like about this is, and this is what I'm gonna be taking on the backpacking trip. What I like about this is that it allows me to just keep the capture clip on so I can move it from my backpack, uh, still wear it on my backpack, but I can move it into tripod mode where I can have it in vertical orientation very easily. And so how that works, is you just slide it in here like this and slide it in there like this. You tighten this back thing like that, kind of test it. And then you have an L bracket that is, in, this is compatible with any camera that has a square or I mean, any kind of, almost any kind of uh, Arca Swiss plate. So it's really handy. You kind of have this, you can use this for, like I said, any camera, I can carry this, and then I can have just the, the one plate on there at all times. So this thing has been really handy. I've really only had it a couple months, but I've been extremely pleased with it. So it's the Acrotec, I think universal L bracket, I think is what it's called. So, um, I guess let's talk about tripods since we're, we're kind of there. The tripod head that I use is also by Acrotech. It is called the long lens uh, head. They have a pano head that basically does the same thing. It just has a little more features and is a little bigger. Um, it's called the long lens head because you can, you can kind of 
use it like a, almost like a, uh, so you can use it almost like a fluid head. It's not a fluid head, but you can almost use it like it. And what I like about it is it's really good for taking panoramas. Um, here, I'll just get the whole thing set up here so you can kind of see. And then, so it's really good for taking panoramas. It has this huge level ball thing in the um, leveler, uh, spirit level in there so you can find level. And then I have for my tripods themselves, I have two, two main tripods other than the little tabletop tripod that you saw for the menu setup, which is also by Leo Photo. But I have two main tripods. I have this guy, which is the Leo Photo 255 CEX. So this is my backpacking tripod. It is extremely light. I really like how light and compact it is, but still very solid and it gets fairly high. And my main, main tripod. So I basically, we use this tripod unless I'm backpacking and really need to save weight. And that is the Leo Photo LS324 CEX. So I think they call them Rangers. I think Ranger is like a, a sub name. So the big advantage of these tripods is they have a built-in leveling base, which makes panoramas so easy. Here, I'll just use the short one here to kind of demo. So we'll put, I use the same head on both. Um, I have like a spare, so you are able to level it. Turn it down. You level the tripod here. Um, you can level, let me re reduce the height here a little bit so you guys can see. Ooh. And then it makes panoramas super duper easy. You can just rotate it and everything's level. It turns out great. And, and even for non-panos, I just find that getting a level base and then composing with this, uh, it's called leveling base, so, and then composing this is really uh, superior. So the Acrotech long lens head, really a great piece of, equipment and the best tripod head I have found. And it pairs extremely well with these Leo Photo uh, tripods with the level, built-in leveling base. You can get an external leveling base, but it's not as compact as these Leo Photo. Um, the tripods I have wrapped in uh, a bicycle hand grip tape. So if, when it's cold, you can grab it. I think that was a tip that I saw on, uh, I think Hudson Henry um, his YouTube channel. I think he does that to his tripods and that's worked great for me for years now. I've had these wrapped. And the Leo Photo tripods are actually not priced that bad for their build quality and they're carbon fiber, so they're not super heavy. So I'm very pleased with the Leo Photo. I don't think you can go super wrong with them. You know, they probably won't last as long as like a really right stuff, but really right stuff doesn't even make one with the built-in leveling base. So I would uh, tend to think that the Leo photos are really good for that. Okay. All right. So we're getting down there on the accessories, uh, except for, well, we still haven't even looked at the backpacks, which is super fun, but so filters. So again, filters are one of those things that is kind of a personal preference thing, how much you use them as a landscape photographer. I am in the, I don't use them very much camp. So my filters do double duty. They are the Peter McKinnon VND 82 mil uh, filters. So here, let me get the, I can show you how these work. Um, they are maybe not what you would typically pick for landscape photography. Uh, I feel like a lot of people 
I think there's a, a company called Case that's really popular right now. I think there's some other ones that are really uh, popular for filters, but I'm not a huge filter guy. The time that I use filters in the field is going to be when I need to reduce my shutter speed more than I can otherwise. So if I'm trying to like have uh, the sky blend out, blur out, or water blur. That's really the only times that I use filters. I don't have any other special use filters. I don't use circular polarizers. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. It just, one, they're kind of a hassle. They're something extra to bring. And I have the 82 mil, and then I use the little ring adapters so I can put this on the 24120. And then this is the two to five stop. I probably wouldn't use the two to five stop for anything but video, uh, but since it's the one I have out. So I have a two to five stop and a six to 10 stop. So I go up to 10 stops on these. So basically what you do is you unscrew this part and then you screw this on. And then you have a nice little cap. And then you just, pry that off and then you have a uh, circular, I mean, ex excuse me, a variable uh, neutral density filter for reducing your shutter speed. Um, and that, that, you know, like I said, I used it a couple times a year. So these filters live in what I call my landscape photography main bag. I don't bring them backpacking or on super high mileage long days because I just, I'm probably not gonna use them. I may not even bring a tripod, which you're, if you're using the filters, you're gonna use them while they're on a tripod, so. And, you know, these Peter McKinnon uh, Polar Pro ones, they're made by Polar Pro. I call them Peter McKinnon because he's the branding, but they're Polar Pro. Uh, I don't notice a huge sharpness fallout from them. I'm sure there are better filters out there, but these ones work great. And the main time I actually use them is when I'm shooting video. So they kind of do double duty that way. So, and this is the Shimoda, uh, once again, Filter Wrap 100 is what it's called. This is a great place to kind of have all my filter stuff, one spot, because I don't use them very often. So let's move this over here. Uh, power. So I do carry this most places. I've got my Melanzana sticker on there, so. Uh, Colorado outdoor kind of inside thing. Um, and then this is an anchor, uh, I'm not sure what it's called, but it's like a medium power uh, power brick. It does not have any branding on here, but it is made by anchor. Um, I do carry this backpacking. I carry this most places that I have my camera so I can just do a quick charge if I need to. And then I also have this small rig battery charger. This is like, this is really cool. So let me actually get my little, oh, my ditty thing's right here. So let me get my ditty thing here so I can show you what I can do here with this whole power setup. So I've got my batteries here. So if I'm in a hotel room or at camp or in the car or anywhere, I can charge a lot with this system. So this has a built-in USB-A cord right here. So I can do this. I can plug this in and then I can charge two batteries here. And it kind of gives you all the info that they're charging. That's super nice. So I can charge two batteries here, plugged into here. And I can charge a third battery in the Z8. With the uh, power delivery here. So just set up like this, plug it in. So now I have my external battery. My external battery is charging uh, three batteries. So essentially I could be like, I've could gone from like, I have one battery, I'm limping along to having three 
charged batteries in a few hours. Now, that's going to pretty much kill this guy <laughs> to charge them all. Uh, but it's a great system. I've really liked it and having all this stuff. And it's very small and compact. So, yeah, this pretty much goes... This is kind of like, again, at that main camera bag level. All right, so now we're to my absolute favorite part of the accessories, and that is the camera bags. I'm a huge bag geek, um, much to my wife's chagrin because I like a lot of camera bags. Uh, but I've kind of narrowed it down to my three main ones. I kind of have a seasonal rotator, which I'll talk about in a second, but I have three main camera bags. Uh, well, three ones that are for my three major uses. So this is my main camera bag my that I've referred to several times in this video. And this is the Explore uh, V2 35 liter. And I like this camera bag because it's not that big. Uh, it, it feels compact for as big as it is for a full 35 liter bag. It can hold anything I would want in it. It's got a big cavernous pocket in there. The build quality on these Shimoda bags is peerless, I feel like. I just, I really, if Shimoda makes it, I like using it. And this is not sponsored or endorsed by Shimoda at all. I just feel like the time and attention to detail that they put into their camera bags is, is peerless. I, I really like what they're doing. And the aesthetic is really good. Um, so this is kind of, this is, so when would I be using this bag? If I'm going on a day trip where I'm gonna be mostly driving, maybe doing several, a uh, couple, several mile hikes. I mean, it can hike as long as you want it to. Um, it's maybe a little just on the big side for non backpacking. Or if I'm bringing the, you know, a bigger lens, uh, various things like that, but it holds everything. I will keep my filter kit in here. I'll keep my full power kit in here. So it holds a 16 inch, MacBook Pro, uh, like a like a pro. It has, you know, enough space for jackets, tons of accessories. I will do a full. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time here talking about it, but I'll do a whole video on this bag and maybe all of these bags at some point. So, that's my main camera bag. So my day trip hiking and climbing. So I use the brand new re-released Action X V2 25 liter. And this is for long hikes, big days in the mountains where, you know, car to car in one day, you know, 14ers, stuff like that. So it, it's small, it's compact. It holds basically exactly what I need and nothing more. Um, and it's lightweight. So, and it does hold my Z8, uh, 24, excuse me, my Z8, 24 to 120, 100 to 400. It holds it all great. I even have space for an extra thing, like a small compact camera or an extra lens. So yeah, this is a great, and I'm so glad that Shimoda did that slightly smaller size. I took the, well, probably I'm messing my mic up here. I took the waist belt off of this one. I took the waist belt off the other one too, just because I'm not a huge waist belt guy. Uh, so yeah. But the last, but not least, at all, whoa, it's, it's kind of a mess here because I was getting it ready. This is the moment, oh boy, he's got a name for it, the Alex Stroll. It was designed by Alex Stroll, who is a fantastic nature, wildlife, landscape photographer. Uh, it's called the Mountain Light 45 liter. This is the backpack that is coming with us to the San Greta Cristos. This is my overnight backpack. It, it is 80% outdoor bag uh, with 20% camera bag. This little space right here, this is where your camera stuff goes. It's not big. It's not gonna hold a whole lot of extra stuff. If you're doing a two body system, you're gonna have a hard time, but it carries very well. The actual bag itself is very lightweight and it, I, it's just a great overnight backpack, backing, backpacking backpack that does it. It's designed for a capture clip in mind. It attaches right here 
or right here, depending on your preference. It's got two little spot with stats, super cool, but has pockets for phones and uh, phones, water bottles, whatever. It's just, it's designed like a very modern backpacking backpack, but with photography in mind. Great product by Alex Stroll and Moment. I, uh, I hope it's been popular because in that it's taken off, that, that it's sold well because this is an underrated backpack that I think most outdoor landscape photographers would want in their quiver if they backpack at all or they climb. And it can be stripped down. Um, again, you'll see this probably uh, better demonstrated in the field because it's the one that's coming with me. So I should probably not spend the most time on it, but you can strip it down for Summit if you have a high camp. You can take this whole top part off and it's designed to compress down and be a smaller backpack. It's a fantastic piece of equipment, really well designed. So, all right. Well, we've talked about, we've walked through the Z8. We have gone through the menus. We've talked about all the accessories that I use for it. Finally, we are ready to head out into the field. So we're going to be heading out to the San Greta Cristo Mountains for a backpacking trip. The, and I'm really excited to take all of this stuff that we've done and then make it all these learned and talked about and make it practical and you can see what we can actually capture with it. So that's going to be in part two of the Nikon Z8 Landscape Photography Field Guide. Welcome to part two of the Nikon Z8 Landscape Photography Guide. We are exactly three minutes from sunset. We are at, we are deep in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, almost as deep as you can get in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. And we, this is the Cristo Needle. So I'm set up with the Nikon Z8 and the 24 to 120 so we're going to be taking some shots i can talk a little bit about how i have the camera set up right now um i'm on the l bracket the acrotech l bracket i am at one eighth of a second and i'm actually going to turn on the exposure display as i talked about and right now i am uh focusing right on the other side of the lake at f 6.3 and that should be getting everything in focus i'm actually a little a little tight right now i'm going to open up a little wide now you can see on the back screen it looks like those clouds are clipped so i'm going to bring down my exposure quite a bit now um, if you can zoom in a little bit closer on the back screen so just so you can see on the histogram I'm not clipping any of the lower ones, but I'm also bringing a lot of detail from up high. I don't know if you can really see that or not. I'm at 1 15th of a second. That is slow enough that what I'm gonna do, and this is a handy trick. We're just jumping right into the handy trip. So now I have my composition that I kind of like. So now I'm just going to touch, touch the screen and it'll take the shot. So I do that until I get down to like, I don't know, around, 
half second or so, maybe even a little faster than that. And then I don't have to use the two second timer. And if you just touch the back screen, I have never had it, had it fail on me. So I'm liking this composition just by itself. We're having a little bit of that. Um, let me look. So this is a very Kemper composition. Um, so now I'm going into pano mode, which is that's just this. Uh, so I'm on here, I'm at 24 millimeter. And so what I do is I just touch the screen and do the pano, trying to keep it generally in the same. This is so cool. This shot is so cool. Now this is sneaky high dynamic range. Those clouds up there are way brighter than what we're seeing. Your eye and your brain doesn't do what the camera does, but they are way brighter. As you can see, I may have those guys clipped a little bit. No, they, it says it's not. So when we get to the post-production, we're gonna hope. I'm actually going to reduce my shutter speed a little bit. Um, Cause it says, there I'm creeping up. It's one eighth of a second. Cause see, watch, watch when I went up to one sixth of a second. You see how I started climbing the right hand side of that. That means those are clipped. I'm losing information. So I go back down to one eighth. We're good. So let's do another pano. Uh, one eighth of a second is a little on the slow side for touching the screen, but I'm gonna do it anyway because I'm wanting to move quickly. So let me talk to you a little bit about my composition. I tend to like, I like compositions like this, where we're up higher than a lake and looking down. I like my mountain lakes, <laughs> sounds so weird to say. I like my mountain lakes a little bit more as like foreground elements it gets real tempting to get close to them and get ultra wide. And that's a great look and I've definitely done it. It can be super cool, especially if you uh, like do a slow shutter speed and have it um, go a long way out. Oh, look, the fish are just going crazy. Um, but I do not, I kind of like, I like the crystal needle here in the shot and the clouds coming in because this is just kind of a very, extreme um, situation. I'm gonna check my exposure again. We're good. Um, this is just kind of an extreme situation. I've not, I've been up here. This is probably the ninth time maybe? Nah, maybe not quite that many times. Never done anything like this. So, you will kind of see when we get into post-production what I mean, but I like, I definitely want the lake there as a composition element, especially with it reflecting some of the light. I don't know if you can come in close on there, especially with it reflecting some of the light like that. I really think that's cool. Actually, this composition just by itself is really cool. I'm gonna snag one um, and it's just, wow. This is really, really an interesting photographic situation. Like, I don't know that I've been like this. And like, you can see it's like, popping off behind us with pink. There's not a composition that way, but it's like extremely cool. So, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into two second timer now. And on the Z8, the easy way to do that, hold down the uh, drive mode button there and just click the back wheel one time to the left and you're in it. So now, now, I'm not gonna fuss around with focusing every time. I'm gonna grab focus where I know it's in focus. And I'm gonna show you that grabbing it on the other side of that lake, because nothing is that close to me and I'm at 24, everything should be pretty sharp. Let's go on up to the summit, which is gonna be the furthest thing away. Yeah, razor sharp. So, technically I probably could even focus closer than that and get the summit in focus. 
but since I want the needle in focus, guaranteed, that's what I'm gonna do. So now, because I'm in two second timer mode now, now I don't have to fuss around with focusing for every shot because I know I have my focus. It's not gonna change. So I just tap the shutter and it goes. Come over. Come over. All right, this super wide panel is getting less interesting because the clouds have rolled out. So now. Still love it though. Man, yeah, it's super cool. I'm gonna do something else here. So now let's try to find another composition here. Um, I'm gonna zoom in and I think this is gonna be a single shot. Oh yeah, that's hot. Look at that right there. That is super cool. Very moody. Um, let's get back up close to the meter. I'm gonna, let me see what's going on on the histogram. Yeah, it's starting to climb right there. So one one third of a second, F6.3, ISO 64. Um, if I wanted a slightly sharper shutter speed, I'm at 28. I think I could get away with F5.6. I think I'm gonna go with F5.6. Just get that shutter speed up just a tiny bit. So change the composition, refocus. And there you go. This is a situation where I really like being able to get the back screen completely clear of anything. So watch this, see all this clutter on the screen? Go to clear, yeah. So that band going across the middle. I mean, it's very interesting. I don't know, maybe like, let's try a, Yeah. So this is some moody blue hour shooting. So this is a big, this is a big deal. I am not a fan of stopping shooting until there's no light. To me, this is actually an incredible image. I think that's gonna be, I really like what the water's doing in the foreground. It's there but it's not, like, it just, it pulls you into the scene. Um, I feel like every element in this, in this shot is really nice. I'm, I'm loving this. I'm just gonna grab several more. And I like the glow in the background. We might be able to work with that a little bit in post. I don't like changing skies too much. Um, I like, you know, to work with the sky I got and see what I can get. I feel like this shot is interesting enough all on its own. As a matter of fact, let's try something here. I'm just curious what it would look like monochrome. Take a look at that. So what I did there to preview it monochrome, remember we set F3 to be picture style. So I just did the scroll wheel over to monochrome, holding it down. So that's where we were. We were in auto, there's neutral. There's monochrome. I like doing, when I shoot shots that I want to try in black and white, I like previewing it and that way I can get, um, I can get, oh, don't want an auto, want it in standard. I actually kind of, let's see vivid. It's very interesting. Um, I, it helps with exposure because when you're shooting in black and white, um, it's all about you overexpose and underexpose things in a way you never do with color because you're already removing the viewer from reality. Um, I'm going to bust out the pano again because I like this composition. So this is another thing that I do is I oftentimes find a composition I kind of like outside and then I switch to a panorama mode but I kind of want to give it a little, I want to take at least, I want at least I want to try a couple with some breathing room with a similar composition. Let me get back into my exposure display mode. So yeah, I can definitely start slowing the shutter speed down. Um, I'm gonna get out of this vivid thing that I did. That was stupid. Um, 
that's pretty good. Not over or underexposing anything. I kind of want to get it over to there. So let's start the pano right there. Clouds are just doing such interesting, interesting things. Now we're not going to get, I don't think, we're going to get any light, any more light. So now it's just going to be, as far as composition goes, are the clouds going to do something else? So let's just hang out for a couple minutes and I'm going to have some chicken and rice and we'll see what the clouds do. Awesome. This is one of those situations where I think I'm gonna have to manual focus. It's not focusing. Um, it says it's not quite. Let's see. We'll go with it. Okay, so we have clouds rolling in in front of us at f8. I have a 60 second exposure. So let's see what cool things the clouds can do. Um, uh, so ISO 64, F8, 60 second exposure. Clouds literally, I mean, we're sitting here watching them move. So it's gonna do cool stuff with like um, ghosting out. So it's just gonna be, can we get lucky with the composition. This is the kind of thing like that I was talking about um, uh, in the uh, first part that like, I can't, you can't, I can't plan this. I couldn't have planned that this is what was gonna happen. And then we come out here and shoot and I get to share something, you know, really cool like this happening. We're actually literally watching the clouds rolling out right now. We've kind of got this one little guy left we literally couldn't see it a couple minutes ago. It's, we literally couldn't see it probably, what, five minutes ago? Less than five minutes ago? Yeah. I have right, a, let's see. I have a clip to show kind of the speed. So we are going to really go dive deep into the, deeper into these images in, uh, uh, in post, in the third part. But that is, that's a really cool image. I'm really excited about that. I think we're going to stick around up here a little longer, see if the clouds come back. I'm kind of kicking myself that I didn't actually think about it a little sooner, but <laughs> doing the long exposure. But I still got a cool couple of really cool images. I'm very pleased.
there's a composition, I believe that is Marble Mountain over there. And then you have the lake right below it. And I definitely want to grab one of that. So we're at one half second F8. I wouldn't have to be F8 because all of the components over there are far enough away that I could I could do F5.6. I could do F4 if this were handheld. Um, so that's kind of something good to keep in mind. I have a tripod in this situation, but there's like lots of times that we are climbing 14ers and, and doing things like that where I don't bring a tripod. So, you know, it, it's good to kind of keep in mind what you could do. So in this case, I'm at F8 on a tripod but because I don't have anything that close in the composition, um, F4 would probably be fine. Uh, it'd just be getting a little extra sharpness out of F5.6, which if we did stop down to F4, uh, I'm getting uh, a sixth of a second at ISO 64. So um, yeah, a sixth of a second, an eighth of a second, which, here, let's see actually let's just see how hand holdable an eighth of a second is on the z8 had that two second timer still on oh totally hand holdable it's razor sharp uh, let's try one more Let's try one more. Let's uh, go up to a thirteenth of a second. I don't think I'm sacrificing much going slightly below the meter like that. That two second timer is killing me. Yeah, that is a notch sharper but let's see what f5.6 looks like see if we get a little extra sharpness oomph i will have to go down to uh, uh an eighth to pull that off that makes sense that's how stops work Not stupid, two second timer, but. That is sharp, and five six is sharper than a four. I can even kind of see that just on the back screen, so. But since I have it available, we're gonna plop back down there. Stop down to F8, which I do believe seems to me, F6.3, F8, kind of all seem pretty good on this on this uh, camera on this lens excuse me which is the 24 to 120 so over here so that's a little side composition obviously this here is my main composition part of the reason we came up high is that I'm kind of waiting for the orange glow you can see it starting to start I don't know if you can see down in the lake um, there's uh, the orange glow, alpine glow, is going to hit the crystal needle and hopefully turn this lake kind of orange looking. That has happened a couple times before. I feel like conditions are right for it to happen again today, but we we'll, guess we'll see. Um, yeah, I think it's going to, because you can kind of see it starting. So we're, we, we've come up the trail just a little tiny bit. Uh, where we were shooting last night is right down there. So, so I've got a composition sitting at about, what am I at, 35, almost on the button. So this is an extremely high dynamic range um, situation. Like we have shadow being cast by 
Humboldt Peak up over behind us. And we have direct sunlight on the Crestone Needle. We have a little bit of glow on the lake. Um, I like this composition quite a bit. This is one I, I feel like could look good in black and white, as a matter of fact. Just like I was talking about last night, I may I do like switching over to monochrome. And I, I do like it. I do like it in black and white. So <clears throat> mornings like this, like we didn't have crazy light or crazy clouds or anything. We had it was a nice, slow, peaceful alpine sunrise, which experientially is is what you want like those those super gorgeous sunrise are normally somewhat miserable to actually experience there's wind and it's cold or it's wet um and we had uh such an amazing evening last night but i still really feel like going out and shooting is is critical i i i'm not in the camp of like some people are like well if you don't think feel like it inspires you to edit or I've heard several things like that and like it's not just the 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 crazy photographs that are beautiful I find that when things are more like this I actually get much more creative with my compositions so that's something I can shoot start shooting in black and white and start messing around with contrast and and elements like that so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind is that still shoot, still enjoy uh, the experience with your camera and, and just get a little more creative. Like I'm in black and white right now and this is actually a extremely interesting shot that I'm taking. Um, uh, the Crestone Needle with the, the uh, lake kind of looking silver in the foreground and kind of honed in a little bit on a composition. I can talk about the composition real quick. Um, I do, <laughs> it's kind of a matter of taste, but I oftentimes with my shots, uh, Brandon on our channel says, I'd like to take portraits of mountains. And it's very true. That is kind of how I compose. The summit of the needle is right in the center, going right up the center. Here, I'll get on the grid. You can see it's right up in the center of that grid. And then, so the top part of the rule of thirds is kind of the summit area. You kind of have this middle part and this lower part here is the lake. I really like going, clearing it out. I really like this rock down here in the lower right hand side. I feel like it balances out the composition a little bit. And then I just like the lake just being so kind of silvery um, with this black and white. Um, if I wanted, I, I kind of like it on the meter to slightly overexpose, which I don't think is, yeah, I actually, actually have a little more leeway to up my exposure a little bit. I could go as bright as, ah, I like that. Let's try that. So, so yeah, this is what is one of my signature mountain portrait shots. Um, a little wider, I can show you what that looks like. I mean, it's not bad. It's just, you know, it's a little more, it's not as, as tight and as kind of like a, a mountain portrait, which is kind of a, a great, if you're shooting mountains, like it's not the only type of landscape photography, but if you are shooting mountains, that's a great go-to as a starting off point is like, okay, what's your subject matter? I want to shoot that mountain. Okay, compose it kind of like a mountain portrait or like, and that doesn't always mean you have to put the summit in the center. So if I go off center, like, and I know that this would make my dad happy, is a shot more like this. He's a very much, he likes the subject off center. And you know, it's a pretty cool composition. Let's see, bring down my exposure a little bit. And then the other way, I really actually don't think will work, but let's try it just for, yeah, the, the other way. It, I mean, it's, it's actually, there's some interesting things about it. It's a little more mysterious uh, doing it off, off center like that. Black and white, shooting in black and white 
and having the camera in black and white mode, so knowing how to switch to it pretty quickly, is helpful a lot of times for composition because color, um, it's, it removes one of the things that you're having to think about and worry about out of the equation. Now, all of these files on the Z8, because I'm shooting in RAW, they're not in black and white back on my computer. I'm gonna import them and I'm gonna have to convert them into black and white and capture one. So it's not, it's not like I'm locked into having these black and white, but it is helpful right now when you know there's not an obvious thing happening that i'm wanting to capture as far as like the conditions it's helpful to hone in on a composition i like to go ahead and take out something out of the equation like color um you know so now i'm dealing with contrast and composition and kind of what makes those two things interesting the uh the light's going to eventually come in and fill the basin and we'll kind of see how it feels um, then. But yeah, I think it's time to go and make some coffee. Don't you? A hundred percent. All right. Oof. Got my coffee. And we are finally ready to jump into part three. <laughs> it has been a long journey to get here in this video, but we are finally ready to start looking at and evaluating and editing a couple of images. So what I've done here is um, I've imported everything into Lightroom. We're going to use Lightroom today. Um, I do want to make a couple of notes about pro editing programs. One, with Nikon, Z files, I generally prefer uh, Capture One. I like the way that Capture One does its demosaicing, and I think I mentioned that in my 24 to 120 review that I really like Capture One. But for the purposes of this guide video, the vast, vast, vast majority of people watching are going to be using Lightroom and maybe Photoshop. So I want to be kind of cognizant of that. And, you know, your workflow, the Capture One and Lightroom's workflows are so different that uh, I feel like Lightroom's a better baseline, a better starting place um, for some of these guides. So I have imported everything into Lightroom and you're going to, you are going to see it for what it is, which is a whole bunch of images here from the whole day. And some of these images, are stuff I took on camera. Some of these images are stuff that I didn't take on camera. So um, the first thing that I like to do is I like to get my panoramas merged. And so the easiest way to do that is to put them into groups. So this one right here, this was a panorama that I took. I took handheld, took a lot of different frames on that. Looks like we're gonna have some clipping issues, but you know, so uh, I also like to set the color label to yellow. So my panoramas are yellow. And then I just do Command G, and they're all in a group now. Um, these were some single shots that I did. So that's good. Here's another pano, I think. Yep. So there. And we'll do set color label to yellow, Command G for group. These are some single shots. Single shot, single shot, I believe here is a panorama. So, and then command G and we will now speed this up. Okay, now that I have all of the different panoramas in groups and labeled yellow, uh, I'm going to filter them to where I'm just looking at them. Then I will select all of them and click photo merge panorama. And generally speaking, Lightroom's default settings work great for panoramas, except if I was doing, if I had any vertical panoramas, so whereas I was shooting down like this, 
I would do those separately because sometimes they take a different projection mode than um, than the horizontal ones. So I would separate those out, but since this is pretty easy, all of these are horizontal panoramas, we're just going to sit back and wait for Lightroom to do this. All, right, all of those panoramas have now merged and while they were merging, which took quite a few minutes, I took the liberty of kind of going through the photos real quick and picking the ones that I'd like to look at a little more thoroughly. So we're gonna go ahead and filter for those images that I picked. <laughs> it's not all that many. And we're just gonna go one by one through these. The ones that are yellow, of course, are our panoramas. And then the other ones are all single shots. So let's go ahead and start looking at them. This is one that I took shortly before we started rolling on the video, right before we got to the lake. I can see right off the bat that I may have lost some information up here. And even if I didn't, the dynamic range might be a little too much. Yeah, I did lose some of that information up there, which is a little bit too bad. So this one probably is not gonna get a full edit. I really liked this one. I liked the kind of mysteriousness of barely being able to see in the summit just peeking out. Uh, I really liked this one. I liked the color in the sky. I liked the the shrouded uh, Cristo needle, and then you have the lake in the foreground. Uh, it's a centered composition, <laughs> which we talked about in the field that I really like doing. Uh, I'm gonna be interested to see what we can pull out of these edits. Now, this is, I have not edited these photos. These, this is not, this is, very unfiltered. So I'm kind of putting everything out there on this shoot because I kind of, like I said, I want to bring you guys in on the whole experience. I don't know whether we got any portfolio shots on this trip. I think there's some really cool shots. I think we can get a lot out of, but that's not the point. The point is, is that it's a whole experience and working with these Z8 files. This is one of the panoramas. I feel like it's a little stretched. I feel like we need to, um, the, sometimes that happens with the panoramas. It's pretty easy in the uh, transform tool. You can mess around with the aspect. There we go. Something right around there looks quite a bit better. Yeah, that looks a whole lot better. And then you can do scale or you can do cropping to get that little thing out. Yeah, that, that, that looks much better. So yeah, this one. So actually I'm gonna go through and I'm going to one star, the ones I'm gonna for sure come back to to edit. And this is now one of those. Um, this one, I don't mind it. It's a little, the clouds are being a little funky. I don't like it better than this one or this one. So yeah, we, I don't think we'll come back to that one. This one's interesting. Um, I think I, I feel like I need to do the same thing with the aspect ratio. Let's see, Let's see how that looks. <clears throat> yeah, but I don't like it better than the other ones. So I think we'll, we'll move on from this one. I love this one. I love what the clouds are doing. I'm hoping it says quite a bit of it. The sky is clipped, it looks clipped. Let's see. Oh no, it's more clippable. And I kind of like it, honestly, the glow. This is a good, just composition. It has good movement. I love the blue tones in the lake down here. So this is definitely an edit one. This one just didn't, this was a panorama that just didn't come together. Um, I don't feel like it's a little overexposed which was tricky. I can bring the highlights down and it's like kind of a situation where, yeah, it's cool, but I like this shot better. So yeah, I don't think we'll come back to that one. This one was a long exposure one, very mysterious. Um, just kind of curious what I could get out of this one. It's just kind of a very moody image, mysterious image. So yeah, we'll come back to this one just after a little bit of, of kind of messing around. This one, one of my favorites from the trip. So definitely coming back to this one. Uh, 
there's nothing really in particular to say about this one. This one <laughs> is one of the astro shots that I showed at the in the uh, part two that I got. That I I don't know what what we would be able to get. We can pull the shadows up, and yeah, you get you get some. Actually, uh, it's kind of cool. Not gonna lie. Uh, ISO 500, quite a bit of detail. I think for to do a print or something, we'd have to do a lot of hot pixel cleanup. I've done that before. I'll do it again. Uh, definitely coming back to this one. That is very intriguing. Uh, the next morning, I picked two of these because I couldn't quite decide at the time when I was looking at them. Now that I am looking at them again, I think definitely this is the one. So we're gonna do that. This is the one that is going to be that we that we took in black and white. I think we'll just experiment, see what we think, and then this is the panoramic version of that with the glowing lake. This is a very kind of basic shot, but we'll talk about that. Um, bringing the highlights down, get some. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Okay, so let's go back to our grid view now that we've gotten it down to just these. All right, so these are the ones that we're gonna take a little bit more in-depth look at. So now that we're kind of getting into the editing phase, let's talk about what programs, what other programs I might use uh, for this video. Photoshop and Luminar Neo are two programs that I use a ton for editing. I love Luminar Neo is kind of my creative space that I go to to uh, kind of work on color and, and do some creative things. There's some really interesting tools in there that, that I'm excited to show you. So basically what I oftentimes use is I use Lightroom or Capture One. They, I use them the same way to get as far as I can. Then I export to Photoshop, edit in Luminar Neo for uh, Photoshop and Luminar Neo to kind of finish it up and then bring it back into Lightroom for cataloging, permanent cataloging. So, all right, let's go ahead and look at these. So this one, we're gonna get into the develop module. I just don't want that over there. <clears throat> So this was 1 15th of a second, 6.3 ISO 64. I think if you remember from the video, I focused right here. So let's go ahead and see what is all in focus. The foreground is definitely in focus. And then the furthest away is the summit. So definitely I nailed the focus on that one. So let's go ahead and start with raising our shadows globally. And I think a little bit of a global shadow raise is in order. I think that worked out well. I'd like to get this middle band uh, a little brighter. Let's see. Sorry, that was not what I meant to do. Um, I'm trying to think the best strategy here. Let's try finding where those clouds kind of sit on the histogram. So, I mean, on curves, so on the histogram. So with curves, this is basically a mirror of your histogram behind it. So what I'm trying to do is figure out where the clouds in the middle kind of sit the strongest, and they're very much a mid-tone. I feel like kind of right in here. Um, too much on the sky. Let's go ahead and just do a sky mask. Oh, here we have an interesting thing. It selected some of that. Interesting. So we're gonna have to do it the old fashioned way. So let's go ahead and delete that sky mask. Let's do a linear gradient, bring it down. So we're not clipping that. Honestly, the sky I kinda wanna leave as close to as it was as possible. Bring it down just a little bit. So, okay, let's go back. I think I do maybe just want a global exposure bump a little bit and then go back to that sky mask 
and bring down the exposure kind of in ratio. I don't want to get too much of a haloing, but a little bit of, of gradient in the sky, I don't mind. And then on the bottom here, I think I want to do another linear gradient on the bottom here and just bring it up with exposure just a little bit. Okay, so let's see where we are at. Let's do before and after. Overall, I think I like it. I think I'm gonna bring some highlights globally down a little bit. And I also think the sky gradient is just a little bit too extreme. So instead of using exposure, I'm gonna use highlights. So I have less of a, so you can't see that gradient as much. As a matter of fact, I may just eliminate zero out that exposure change altogether. Okay. So yeah, I just kind of adjusted the highlights. It's not clipping. I just don't want it to even have the perception of clipping. So this one's ready to begin its round trip into Photoshop and Luminar. So let's look at the other ones first before I do that because just in the interest of time, I really want to only take the ones I really want to edit in this one. This one, I do like the tones. It, it's a little magenta. It kind of went magenta a little bit. So I'm going to pull it back. And let's go ahead and bring down the highlights some and then up the shadows, which so be careful doing that that's kind of a default thing to do for landscape photography is to lower the highlights, raise the shadows. But remember when you're doing that, you are essentially re eliminating contrast. So taken to its extremes here, we have a much lower contrast image and we want, we want some contrast inherently. So I like the moody shadows. I want you to be able to see that it's a lake. You can see the, fish jumping in the lake like I talked about in the video look at that they were going crazy yeah it really this is a image that needs contrast let's try just putting a classic s curve on there and immediately we're we're getting somewhere the sky is getting a little bit too much but not it's not that bad uh, the histogram says I'm not clipping anything but the foreground, which is interesting. Okay, so I'm liking this a lot better. I feel like the foreground's a little dark. So we'll do a linear gradient here. And then we'll just up the, pull the exposure up just a little bit. Might actually get it into the, into there. So let's do a little before after on this. So there's the image we got originally, and here's where we are now. Overall, um, a big improvement, and I'm starting to really like it. I like the vibe of this image, and I like the contrast between the Crestone Needle. Let's see what a little bit of clarity does. I like what the clarity is doing here not as much of a fan of what it's doing in the foreground. So let's reset that and let's create, do a radial gradient. And I will just kind of draw a rough oval over this area. And then now let's add that clarity not not too much but definitely some makes it and then we don't need a all right let's see how that looks yeah that looks cool this one so this one's definitely a candidate to be round tripped there's this one which i really liked a little bit of an exposure bump. Just bring it up just a little bit. Keep the highlights down. I wonder if the sky will select on this one. Yep. So let's 
lower the sky, but maybe increase the saturation just a little bit. I like that. And warm it up. No, not too much. I want it to keep it kind of realistic. We'll work with that glow here in a minute. And then let's do some global contrast here. Yeah, there we go. I like that. Love the, again, love the tones in the foreground here. Keep kind of pulling that along, keeping an eye on my histogram, make sure nothing's clipping, which nothing is. Yeah, so here's a before and an after here. I'm liking the direction. We'll do, this one we'll take into Lightroom and Photoshop. Now this one, I have no idea here what we're gonna do with this one. Um, let's uh, raise the exposure some. It's very blue. So let's warm it up just a little bit. There we go, that's better. Highlights down a little bit. And then let's just see what an S curve. It's getting interesting. We've lost a little bit too much of the foreground. I'm gonna bring that back. Linear gradient. And then just a little bit. All right, so here's a before and an after there. Before and after. I think I'm going to bring uh, desaturate some of the blues just in general. This one. Yeah, there we go. I like that. I'm starting to like that one. Okay. This one. Um, there's parts of me that like. I don't want to mess with this one too much, but I like it. I'm going to raise my shadows a little bit. I'm going to warm it up just a skinch. And then increase the contrast just a little bit. We have a similar problem that we did with the other one where the foreground and there. And then how do we feel about the sky? Let's warm the whole image up. Just a skinch, yes. I actually think a little bit too much sky. I'm gonna crop it. All right, so here's a before and an after. Yes, that's looking great. That's gonna, and we have this one. <laughs> this one is just very interesting. The uh, star trails here. This is why you don't don't go to bed until you've experimented some. Okay, I'm actually gonna cool this one off a little bit. I feel like that looks certainly interesting. And this was a 508 second exposure. So these clouds moving through, I, I like it. I have to say. Then this one, it's a lot I like about this one, except for the sky is very boring. But let's go ahead and select it. And Bring the exposure down and then cool it off a little bit. Or do we want to warm? No, 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 no. There we go. That's better. This one. Let's. I mean work out it was at all. 
The highlights are a little strong, the dynamic range. Let's try a black, a little bit of black and white mixing here. See, I really, what I want is the lake. So what I might do is There we go. I like that. That's very interesting. See what's clipped. No, nothing. It's just this little snow patches on there. All right. This is now interesting. I think that maybe I've been a little extreme upon the needle. But maybe like right there. All right, well, this is at least interesting now. It's also interesting in color, but that's what this one's for. And this one, let's just move the shadows along a little bit. Maybe warm it up, or do I like that color contrast? I think I like the color contrast on this. Maybe it's just the black point, yeah. the black point was a little and this one definitely is a candidate for some color it needs to be a little bit more vibrant but i will do that more targeted okay so now that we've kind of gone through them again i think the ones that i'm more interested in editing in photoshop and luminar let's go ahead and do this one Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna create another layer. We're gonna go filter, Skyloom software, Luminar Neo. Now you of course have to have Luminar Neo installed for this whole segment to be useful. And you know, honestly, the, this image is close enough in Lightroom. I might, I might tweak it a little bit, but I really just did wanna show you my workflow. And we'll start with the enhance and right away that's doing some kind of cool things let's not overdo it but i like overall a lot of contrast here i like the color let's do let's just see what super contrast does the sky on this one seems to be kind of a a knife's edge a little bit in keeping it looking realistic Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so let's do a little before and after. So there's before, there's after. Definitely, definitely like it better. Um, let's see what adding a little bit of golden hour does. Um, I like some things about it. It's saturating things maybe a little bit too much. Maybe just like a little tiny bit. And this one has potential to have, so uh, Luminar has these LUTs that are very interesting. They can do some interesting things. So I kind of sometimes will go through them and see if any of these kind of capture a vibe. I like what this one's doing with the contrast right here, but it's doing too much of it. So let's back it off where it's just yeah just adding a kiss of contrast the sky on this image is just problematic it doesn't i mean even though it was what it was doing it looks like it should be cloudy then you have this kind of sky so i don't know and this the glow is a little bit the glow is a little bit funny. Let's try. Let's try. Just 
swarm in the hole in the job. Not too much, just a little. Two, straight three. Yeah, I think I like that. I think I like that. I think yellow is a little saturated in the foreground here. Let's go to HSL. And then just pull a little bit of the yellow so it's not so eye catching. I mean, I like it. So, okay, let's do it before. Ah, much better. It's not, I don't know if it's a portfolio image, but I like it. So yeah, I round tripped that through Photoshop and Luminar. Now that I'm thinking about it though, uh, if I'm just gonna use Luminar, just use it as a plugin in Lightroom. I don't have to take it into Photoshop to use it as a plugin like I do with Capture One. So there's the DNG from the panorama and there is the uh, post luminar edit. So that's cool. All right, this one. Um, and I think I will just bring this one straight into luminar. I don't think that it needs any Photoshop work. So when would I use Photoshop? Um, if I needed to edit some, like really change a part of the image or do some, uh, healing or anything like that, that's when I would use actual Photoshop, but let's just go and bring it into um, edit in Luminar Neo right there. Okay, so similar. Let's just look at enhance. See, this is a, you just, it, it adds, but if you add too much, this accent AI, but I want to add a little bit. I do just love the tones in this image. It just needs a little bit of pop. So like with the other one, super contrast may be where I want to go. There we go. Yeah, I like that a lot. So let's do it before. Yeah, this one's coming together very nicely. The sky. Let's see what Golden Hour does to this one. I think a little bit helps a little bit. I'm a, I'm a little concerned about this clipping. It did kind of look like that in the field, but I don't want it to look clipped. The transition's pretty good, but let's see which setting is doing that the most. It's definitely in the super contrast down here. Oh, I have to go over to edits. It's kind of a pain. Yeah, it's in that highlights contrast. So we're gonna back that off. What we can do is, because I like what it did here, is let's just radial gradient. This area so that we're getting it just not, okay. Oh, so that's, uh, there we go. Now it's a little too much. I think this is eliminating it altogether the right call at least we tried so I feel like this guy is a little better 
Um, I definitely feel like doing a little bit of shaping on this, but we'll do that back in Lightroom. Um, yeah, so I think this one's in a good place. Maybe just a little. Cool. So yeah, not not a lot here, but I like I liked this image in Lightroom. Honestly, probably could have just left it. But we'll go ahead and apply that. And then I do want to do a little bit of light shaping here. So the main way I do that is with linear gradients and radial gradients. So let's pull up from here. This just helps your eye. Um, so there's a variety of different ways. I think I'm just going to just reduce the exposure there. That's good. Then let's do another one up here. Kind of drag it out so there's a lot of gradient so you don't see the line. But it just helps keep the, the image here. And then let's do a radial gradient across this middle section here. The crystal needle is the summit, is the subject kind of here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to up the exposure just a hair right here. I'm also going to add a little bit of clarity, which kind of gives the illusion of sharpness. So your eye is going to be drawn here because the eye looks for sharpness and brightness first in an image. So if that's what kind of what you want. So let's look at it. There's before, there's after. Is it a little much? Probably. So let's bring it down just a little bit. So now let's look at it. That's perfect. And then I was trying to decide if I want to have this glow be warmer. The way we would do that is we would have a radial gradient here. And then what it would do is it would just make it feel a little more intentional. Actually dragging it out just a little bit and okay let's see how we think oh I, I like it I think it helps it for sure to warm up that area um, it helps the image as a whole so this our little light shaping session here let's just do a quick before and after so there's the before still a really good image after a little more emphasis up here this is a little warmer it's subtle but i like it so this is i'm going to give this image another star i think so far this is the the image of the day um this one let's not do much more time on this one let's go ahead and look at this one um up the exposure just a little bit. The sky is a problem, although that helped. Um, shall we look in Luminar? Shall we see? Shall we see what Luminar holds for this one? I just like the composition of this one. I like the softness of the clouds. I like the relationship between the summit and of course, just the overall mood. This one would be a prime candidate to go ahead and take the mood up to 11. Let's just look at some of these custom LUTs. That one's cool. That one's cool, but a little bit magenta. There we go. That's a home run. That's a home run, I think. So before, after, 
just did exactly what I was looking for. I may want to pull maybe just a little bit of the blue and I can do that just pulling the saturation out a little bit. But yeah, that's uh, that's why we come into Luminar is to get that little just oomph. Now let's work on the sky a little bit in Lightroom again. I'm gonna go ahead and select it. There it is. And let's just bring down the exposure just a little bit. And honestly, just maybe. Let's actually do a radial gradient. I think I maybe just want a little tiny bit of an exposure bump on the lake. Yeah. Okay. Well, now maybe this is the, the shot of the trip because I, I like the vibe. Oh, you know what? I, I think, I think let's, uh, let's give a little bit of contrast to the sky. Let's just see if that helps. So there's before, after, definitely. But keeps your eye up in this area. And you know what, let's, let's just home run hit it. Cause I like this area and I really want your eye to kind of go there. And then you can see I'm doing very small announce that that's a, less than a quarter of a stop exposure bump. And then like, Or clarity. I think I need to make it smaller. The area that I'm doing and then. So let's see if this actually does anything that we like. Yeah, I, okay, I like it, but we need to come back down to the lake and balance it out by raising the lake up just a little bit. I feel like that, that's a balanced image. Now the lake's a little bit too bright. All right. Yep, that's great. Two stars. This one, Honestly, this one would take so much work that I'm just gonna kind of leave it as is. I kind of like it as it is. Um, we could, there's a lot of little things we could do to kind of, but it's got so many hot pixels. It's just fun that we got anything at all at F4. Actually, the clarity bump was awful. Um, we could reduce the noise, um, but that's kind of involved. So I think it's, we're just going to enjoy the fact that this image is usable at all. Let's jump straight to this last one because I do want to edit this one in Luminar just to see it. And then we'll look at them all again and close this thing out. Wow. I'm going to go to Enhance, Accent. Yep, I like it. Go to the landscape, golden hour. Let's just do it. There, I like that. It just, it warmed it up in just the right way. And then, so I do want to take a minute once we're done. editing this image now the whole there's a global saturation issue but no problem we'll just bring down the global saturation to there so here's a little bit before after and I like it so this image I think as landscape photographers 
we get kind of snobby and snooty about these bluebird mornings like this. But as far as what was interesting was, is that, so I owned and operated a gallery for um, several years. And what was interesting was, is that even though these aren't maybe the most jaw dropping, jump off the wall shots, we sold a lot of them. Uh, people who maybe aren't photographers, who maybe they they like the art, they appreciate shots like this a lot. And I think it's because it's like, it reminds them of an experience they might've had in the mountains. It's very calming and peaceful and kind of ethereal. And in a lot of ways, I, can, I want to step into this image more than some of the other more extreme shots. It doesn't look like this is a miserable place to be, which is oftentimes the case with those more extreme dramatic landscape images you know part of the the allure of it is is not just how beautiful it is but also how much the photographer was suffering to get them which is an absolute truth and we talked about it in the field so don't shy away from taking shots like this and editing them and enjoying them there's they are still they still have value mornings like we experienced in the mountains that morning were are still valuable and they deserve to be captured too, and at least in my opinion. So this shot's not going in my portfolio, but I enjoy it as honestly, like this is something you might put as a desktop wallpaper on your computer, you know, as is like, ah, that's a beautiful place I liked experiencing. It's not as dramatic. So that's kind of my, my hot take with images like this and why you should definitely still take them. And in a lot of ways, I like ending this whole thing with this image because it's it's quintessential of this place. I feel like it represents this place in a lot of ways. Like this image, I've been up there um, lots of times and the conditions have never been like that before. So I've been up there lots of times and the conditions have been like this lots of times. And I think there's value in that. So, <sighs> I think we're finally at an end to this whole Nikon Z8 landscape photography guide. This last part I know has had very little to do with the Z8, except that it's kind of had everything to do with the Z8 because these, Im these are the images that we captured with it, that we set out to capture. And I've really enjoyed this whole process. It's been so fascinating and interesting to kind of think everything through and articulate it in a way and then going out into the field and then just bringing these images home and just kind of sharing what I got unfiltered. Like, you know, like I said, I had, th these images weren't in mind because they hadn't been taken when I started this whole process. Uh, I, I shot all that stuff the first part before I captured these images. So it's just kind of a fascinating thing. And I have enjoyed bringing you along on this journey. And I hope to bring you along on many more. We actually have a A7R5 guide, Sony A7R5 guide in production right now that we're hoping to release in about a month after this one. And it's gonna be same thing. Um, and actually, if there's things in that guide, I don't know how many, how much cross platform we're gonna have because this is kind of a Nikon heavy guide and that's going to be Sony. But if you have any thoughts or questions for that guide, please comment them in the description. So we hope to get that out. And we also have some other guides. I think Toby's working on a guide for uh, a camera for video application. And I'm just excited about this whole process of kind of learning and going out and shooting and, and doing a more raw landscape photography experience. So if this video was valuable to you, going back to the beginning, please hit the like button and subscribe. At a bare minimum, that helps our channel grow. It helps YouTube know that you found this valuable. Um, we also have those themed hats, those um, Z8 owner themed hats available. The link is in the description and pinned comment for that. And if you wanna just straight donate to us and our production here, the thanks button below the video is a great way to do that. So with that, finally, we will see you on the next adventure.